Sure. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dave Fabas, and I'm CEO of the Silks and Technology Cluster. As hopefully you're, uh, a lot of you will know, we're a cluster support organization looking after advanced engineering, electronics, and software businesses in a wider silver scenario. We do that through promotion, support, and thought leadership. So we uh, very much focus on bringing people together, uh, encouraging them to collaborate, um, and making sure that we create business opportunities and help businesses grow. Um, today, we're here to um, for our special interest group event um, from the Digital and Advanced Manufacturing Group, who wants to do something slightly differently. Uh, we have Niall here as one of the champions of the group who will uh, guide us through today. Um, but before we start off, I just wanted to do uh, a quick sort of admin um, housekeeping announcement as well. So we're not expecting a fire drill. Um, so should an alarm go off, then either make your way outside through the way you came in or follow us out to the back there. Um, also, also restrooms and things are back where, um, where you came in at the entrance. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank our host, Hexagon, um, who are obviously lending us their fantastic facility and are putting up all the sandwiches as well. And then I want to hand over to John to uh, talk to us for a moment. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, morning. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Good Excellent. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Grover. Uh, I'm sales and marketing director for Hexagon. Uh, Pim kindly asked me to just do a quick introduction. Give a little bit of information about Hexagon. So I thought the best thing I would do is play a very short video because it's probably an easier way to explain what Hexagon does. Okay. Thank you very much. I did that this morning actually, before we started. <laughs> it's amazing what you do, Photoshop and crayons. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I thought I'd show you that because um, when I came on talking this morning, he said to me, Well, how do you describe what you do? And I said, I've been trying for years to be honest. But um, so, Hexagon as a business, as you can see, is very diverse. And uh, a simple way of saying things is we measure stuff, basically. Okay. Um, and that's a very simplified view of what we do. Um, but it kind of encapsulates most of what we do. So we obviously support most of the manufacturing industries, lots of sectors. Obviously, we're based here in Silverstone with this facility because we are very big in the F1 industry. We support all the F1 teams and uh, their supply chain, for example. But we also work in all other sectors as well, right through from the simulation, CAD-CAM design, uh, the metrology element. That's the bit that we tend to do here a little bit. 
uh, right through also to, to analysis and SPC and data and things like that. So we really work in that manufacturing sector. This particular facility here is one of our satellite sites. We have many of these sites around the UK and Ireland, globally, obviously, we have presence uh, everywhere. Uh, and this facility has really been set up in partnership with MBPC and the Silverstone Technology Cluster to support startup businesses, to support smaller businesses where they require access to measurement equipment, but don't perhaps have the budget today to buy that equipment or the volume of requirements. So uh, there's a lady standing there in the background, you'll see uh, Claire, who manages this facility for us. And if you have any questions or uh, would like any more information, please approach Claire, she'll be here all day as well. Uh, but ultimately what we do here is we provide a subcontract facility for customers. So people that are manufacturing components, it could be what we call first article inspection, it could be batch work, it could be whatever. And they may be a small company, uh, they could be quite a big company as well, actually. And, and ultimately, uh, they don't either have the capacity, the capability or the technology themselves. So they will come to us. Uh, and as a gentleman in there, you can see us at the moment, and we will measure their components and sort of if they're right or wrong, hopefully right, but sometimes not always. Uh, and we provide that service for them. Uh, and, and that's really what this facility is geared up for as well. OK, I'll give it back to you now. Thank you very much. Have an enjoyable day. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, so let's kick off the event. So why are we here today? So um, this uh, event today comes from a conversation we had a few weeks ago at, uh, with the SDC, actually over with the AMC just over the road. Um, my history is mainly in Formula One, um, mechanical systems, hydraulics, that sort of thing. And then currently doing um, uh, specialized packaging for lithium ion battery parts to uh, basically so that lithium ion batteries for vehicles can be assembled um, uh, efficiently uh, and in very clean conditions. Because if, if you don't assemble them in clean conditions, they can get a little bit explodey and that's not very good. Um, <laughs> so we don't like that. Um, but one of the things that we've always had, because we come from that motorsport, uh, way of doing things. We've worked in very close teams. It's people working shoulder to shoulder, clever people with different but complementary skills. And a lot of the companies are saying, hang on a minute, the new way of working, people working from home, we want to recruit good people, but they're coming and saying, well, actually, I want to be working from home two days a week, three days a week. That's causing a cultural change. It's causing us to rethink how we do stuff. So that's why we're trying to talk about this today, to find out how we can do it better, how we can keep the right people, keep them happy, keep them productive, and still produce this uh, real team ethic, which is at the heart of what we all do. So I'm gonna call on uh, my old friend, Simon Garwood, uh, to uh, talk to you first. Simon is ex-Toyota, uh, and also uh, from WMG as well, which is where uh, we came across each other uh, some years ago. Um, and has been extremely helpful to me, and has certainly mentored me when I've run you up and said stuff, and I cannot believe the problems I am having. <laughs> so, uh, hand you over. Thank you, Thank Simon. You. So I better do what I'm told, because I've had a briefing from him, and was very clear I need to stand behind here so that people at home can see me as well. So, uh, um, and it's not my normal style. Um, we did have a discussion. My normal style is. Uh, more non-verbal communication and, um, and, and a headset like Madonna, but we won't go around. Right. Um, <laughs> um, but I just, this, this came from a conversation with Niall um, several weeks ago in that um, effective or efficient and effective working from home. Um, it's a bit of a, an objective at the moment and it's a bit of something that has come about because we've had a huge step change. Um, but, uh, um, I'm very aware that home working has really increased considerably. Um, and, and the other thing is from a people point of view, lots of, lots of people love it and lots of people actually quite hate it. And I don't know what the mix is, but there's no universal answer. I mean, first of it from me, um, now I mentioned um, uh, I was WMG, but formerly um, many, many years at Toyota, um, which is a big global automotive company um, probably has the biggest um, well-being and people-orientated um, 
outlook of, of anyone I come across. So um, hopefully it's a it's a balanced people and company view that I'm going to uh, um, press the space bar. That's it. That's all I need to do. So the question therefore is to work from home or not. Um, slightly contentious. Um, and that clearly not everyone can work from home. Um, the picture there is, um, I believe, the Silverstone Technology Cluster members PPCNA um, of their shop floor. Very difficult to wire up the board or make a wire harness from home. Um, so clearly working from home is not an option for everyone. Um, and manufacturing companies, um, when I took a store poll with a few, and they reckon that 75% of people can't work from home. So um, thinking about that, the party therefore has to be the majority. So the priority is those who are working in the factory and actually their well-being, their safety, um, and actually um, looking after <coughs> them first. So, it then comes to the point where um, you know, they are having to be in an office potentially because the job they're doing is supporting the physical activity perhaps, or maybe the systems aren't as good um, as they should be to allow them to <coughs> migrate to, to home. And um, how to keep them safe during the midst of the pandemic has been on the forefront of many people's minds. Um, uh, going to, back to Toyota, their head office is in Brussels, um, used to have desks packed in, um, you know, like sardines. Um, they have taken away a third of the desks. They now don't have enough desks for all the people who work there um, to give space um, and to give a comfortable, more comfortable working environment. Um, but desks and screens and, um, and more space are really things that people have um, uh, had to come to terms with. So perhaps you can't have everyone working in the office. Um, my, um, my son works um, for an organisation and his commute was somewhat uh, convoluted as were a lot of his colleagues. Um, in, in a lot of people worked um, in, in one area and they were uh, and the uh, office was actually quite remote. And so the, the, the organisation was actually laid on special buses because it's inherently safer for them to go on a works bus that is sanitised before they all get on um, than to go on a walk, train, bus um, to get to work. So everyone has had to really think about um, looking after people in the office or the shop or the factory, wherever they are. Um, but then moving to those working from home, again, I believe, and this is from a straw polls of talking to people, very much from my Toyota experience, but working from home is, is a benefit, it's not a right. Now, that is actually quite tricky. Um, I heard someone mentioning about recruiting people um, and then wanting to work from home. Um, yes, but it's a benefit. So if you want to work from home, it's a benefit. Um, and so, I also heard about companies, um, especially in Silicon Valley, um, suggesting that they are going to um, pay their uh, uh, people working from home less. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but it's a yeah, it's it's a it's an idea that um, it could be um, less productive or less uh, efficient for them to work from home. Therefore, they should be paid less, or it just costs less. Um, um, so there are all sorts of questions that are now being asked, which we didn't ask at the start of the pandemic, when then suddenly everyone had to work from home. Um, the other question is how to manage objectives, objectives um, remotely. So um, in, in, in my day, uh, the objectives were a, uh, um, a, a regular meeting with your um, team leader. Um, you know, where, what, what are your objectives, where are you on your object, objectives, what do we need to do the same, what do we need to do differently, um, but actually how to maintain that communication through um, working um, uh, remotely. There's a, um, an article there which appeared in the Daily Telegraph, um, 
credit it really is the Daily Telegraph, um, but uh, commuting is cheaper than home working for one in five. Okay. <clears throat> the converse of that is that commuting is more expensive for 80% um, than, than working from home. So there is some evidence that working from home is, um, is potentially a bit cheaper for the employees. Um, I mentioned earlier, not everyone wants to work from home. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't get this grey hair out of the bottle, it came with age. And many, many years ago, I worked for a company called GEC Telecommunications, many, many, many years ago, when I did my apprenticeship. And I was always amazed at the guy in the corner who around his desk built a cardboard shed, um, because he didn't want to be uh, interacting with the rest of the office. Um, I can't remember his name now, but we very rarely spoke to him because he, he was in his shed. Um, but I just imagine that he would quite like to work from home if that was an option these days. Um, and, and similarly, um, there are a lot of people who thrive on that interaction, that they thrive <coughs> on that. Um, I've got half an idea, I don't think it's very good. Well, actually, it might be a bit better if you did this or, oh, actually, talk to someone else. So there are other people who really feel isolated working from home and really don't like the fact that they can't just go, oh, actually, Tom, Dick, Harriet, what, what do you think of this? Um, it has to be organised, it has to be a, a, a Zoom or Teams meeting, or it has to be uh, put in the diary. And a lot of people aren't actually that, I'm speaking from personal experience, a lot of people aren't that uh, organised to do that and, and tend to um, think, well, oh, I'll do that tomorrow or I'll, I'll try and get that going. So let's not think that working from home is either something that everyone can do. Um, and it's not to benefit everyone um, and not everyone wants to do it. So we have to work out which, what proportion we, we're talking about and what is sensible. Um, and also remembering very much that working from home um, generally is probably not to the benefit of the company um, unless they do some very serious uh, things to uh, uh, reinforce it. Um, I do apologise, I keep transferring that, probably change the size of the font. Um, so the graph is one that I have built, but it is actually um, from ONS, Office of National Statistics data, um, in that prior to the pandemic, 2019, we were bubbling around all 5 or 6 percent of people working from home at some point in their working week, month, year. Um, suddenly that jumped. Um, quarter, well, end of quarter one, 2020, I think it was 23rd of March, um, to 46% of people working from home, mostly because the government said work from home if you can. Um, so nearly half the people who are working could work from home. Um, and that actually has <coughs> decreased slowly, but has actually settled out around 35% of people uh, in employment um, are now working from home or sometime during the week or month. So um, the thing is, there's a possibility that this is the new normal. Um, and whether that's right or wrong, some people think it's brilliant. Um, it probably is the new normal and it probably is um, backed up by statistics from National Rail, for example, that say, the rail industry is at only 65% capacity. Spooky, that seems 35% of people working from home. Um, so uh, perhaps this is really normal. So perhaps now is the time, rather than we um, knee jerk, oh God, let's just do it in March 2020, um, it's now time to make sure that we're getting the best out of this situation. Um, apologies. Um, I always think about effectiveness and efficiency, um, and um, they're very, very different. Um, so in an office environment, we have spent years and years and years, and again, I think in the transfer to the, um, um, it, it's uh, changed the arrow. The arrow should go from the origin um, through 
survive up to five. So uh, apologies for that. Um, so we have spent years in whatever industry we're in trying to get to that dry box. Um, and we've been working on um, communications, we've been working on objectives and KPIs, we've been working on building great processes, um, building our leaders, um, and, and really looking out for employees' well-being. Um, one, because we have to, and two, because in our companies do that anyway. Um, so we've actually been driving our way up to that box, um, and now all of a sudden, We've got a third of our people who aren't there. So we've got the new problem of making sure that they don't lose all of those things that drove the company to that dry box. Um, I mentioned communication first. Um, so how to replicate that communication route? I'm, I'm talking about the informal and the formal. Um, the daily huddle. Um, if, if you're a manufacturing business, uh, I was speaking to, uh, um, to someone who said that actually we started the first thing in the morning with all of us just uh, getting on to uh, getting on to teams and having a chat. Um, that's one way of doing it. Um, that's why teams is there as a uh, an option. The weekly team meeting, which is more of a where are we, where where should we be, what's the gap, what we're going to do about it. Um, how do we bring in the people who are working from home and feel that they are just as involved and accountable and responsible for those um, objectives that we've got? Um, another one, um, I don't know if the term's familiar, the town hall meeting, which is like the, the quarterly from the chairman, how, how well we're doing. Um, you know, that probably works better because most people sit there and listen to it anyway and you can just as well listen from home. Um, but then you go full circle, and the picture here is of a, um, is a, of a room in TMUK. It's not one that I've taken, it was on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it is a room that I recognise as a, um, what the Japanese call an obeya, um, which literally means big room, it's nothing clever. Um, but the big room is, the whiteboards and the magnetic and if you're running a project everything about that project will be in that room so if you want to know the answer to any question about that project you go to that room so how do you replicate that at home if you've got half of your team half of your project team working from home you'll note i don't have all the answers here i've got a few questions but they're ones that we there are sort of ways around it um, if we're talking about objectives and KPIs, um, the pri it's the primary driver of what people do, and um, KPIs, and, and based on objective. Um, and what I would say is, if people are working from home, be careful that those objectives and those KPIs are what you actually want. Um, it's very easy for people. Um, I was, I was talking to a, a bookshop, a group of bookshops recently, um, and I, I was ordering a, a, a particular book, um, which has got quite rare. It's, it was published in the 90s, um, and it, um, it, it isn't cheap. So I wanted a pristine copy for my shelf. I couldn't get a pristine copy. It went round and round and round, talking, and they obviously have got their little CRM system. And they've got to, oh, Simon Yard has com complained about his book, and the ticket was raised, and it ended up that their customer service team had been tasked with clearing tickets, when in fact what they should have been doing was satisfying the customer. <laughs> um, so it is very, was a very fine line between getting the right KPIs and objectives and really getting them wrong. And if there's someone sitting there in their spare room, answering the phone or answering emails, it's very easy for them to take those KPIs literally and not consider the deeper reason for them. Um, so I, mean, I would say they've gone rogue, but it's not there. They're just actually um, trying to do the best they can, but having not quite aligned um, what they're being told to do with what um, 
department is wanted. Um, so, I don't know what, what has happened there. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to my, uh, my paper copy. What, 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 what was there actually was um, uh, you've got objectives on the, on the right and the KPIs on the left. And, um, and if you do the employees uh, objectives and then measure with KPIs, um, it, it should work. But there is a caveat in there that says it, it might not work very well. Um, and then the other one is to make processes. So if people are working from home, they're relying on processes. They don't, we, we can't um, spin around on their desk and just ask the next person. Um, and what I've worked out is that there's no perfect processes out there, whether that be um, manufacturing anything or whether that be a, an administrative process. They're all, um, I won't say held together by sticky tape, but they're held together by the goodwill and the, and the you know, dedication of the people who operate them. Um, and, when you look at those processes, how will we have buyers be, be dealt with? You know, you always get something which is odd, which hasn't been thought of before. So people working from home are going to go, they're going to sit there and we're going to know how to deal with this. Um, so then they've got to currently get on to um, you know, put something on the CRM or a note on the CRM, or they've got to organize a Zoom meeting. It, it might be that they're working in you know, Trello or Miro. And I don't recommend any of these, and I don't suggest that they're, any of them are any better than any others, but uh, they're just ones I've used, and um, we might do that. Um, but does that actually move things forward in the same way as it would have done when they spun the chair around and said, I've got a problem with this, what should I do? So we've got to think that things might still work, they might not work quite as well. Um, so perhaps on processes, it's time for people to, um, well, what can only be done only in the office, but it's time for people to review those processes. So do they work for people working from home? Yeah. Is, is there a point in that process where normally you print out a bit of paper, walk it across the corridor and give it to someone else? Well, that won't happen if everyone's working from home. So actually, review those processes and, and actually look where it's effective or not effective. And I say effective rather than efficient because efficiency can come later, uh, always. Um, and there are lots of great pieces of software, but in the main, they, they focus on efficiency. So if, um, if it's not doing the right thing, it's not doing the right thing, but it might be doing it really well. <laughs> Um, and also growing leaders. Um, question there is leaders versus managers. Um, I um, I firmly believe in leaders, in that it's very difficult to um, manage people. They generally push back. Um, but if you can lead, you can lead people. You can show them by example. You can coach them. You can teach them. Um, and I think there's going to be talk a little bit more about that. Um, later on, but um, people aren't machines, um, so they really can't be managed. Um, so that's the view that comes out of, out of Toyota very much. Um, and relationships are key. Um, we don't actually do our best work for something. We generally do our best work for someone. And so you have to bear in mind that leaders are still absolutely important in this. And, and the question there is how to keep that relationship between the leader and someone working from home. Um, it's much more difficult to do it remotely than it is to do it face to face over coffee, for example. And, and then we've also spent years building high performance teams or high performing teams. Um, and, and again, from the ONS, 20% um, of businesses found remote working hampered their team's performance. Um, you could say conversely 80% haven't noticed, but um, you know, so there's lives was down lives on statistics. So it is a danger point though, but if you have a team and they are then scattered to the four winds, what, what happens to the cohesion of that team? Um, and it's one to think about. Um, so 
The other one is that if, if you've got 35% of your workforce working from home in isolation, and I, I still think of uh, the guy in his cardboard shed in the little corner of the office in 1980 something. Um, and how do you actually um, encourage him to do his best work? It's probably by giving him some autonomy and some accountability and responsibility and making sure that, uh, uh, and checking in with him or her. Um, but that's actually um, happening is they're still happy to be doing that. Um, well-being. Um, how do you identify well-being issues remotely? You know, how do you identify the, 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 the guy who um, you, uh, you, know, you see, um, used to see every, every day in the office and you used to have a quick chat and, you know, while making the coffee? and talk about some of the problems and the challenges and the issues. Um, how, how do you make sure that he or her, she's, um, she's still okay? It, it's very difficult on the screen to tell if someone's really okay or not. It's much, much easier face to face. Um, so I think this is where leadership really is important, the weekly get together, checking in on people. Um, and, and discuss, discussing those difficult areas. Um, um, and don't forget, as a business, um, you're still responsible for um, things like BSC assessments and the physical environment that people work in. They might be working at their kitchen table, but if they're being paid, um, there is a, a responsibility to make sure that the screen, the, um, the posture is right, and um, it, it doesn't just go away. So. There are a lot of things here that, and as I say, I don't have all the answers, they're just posing questions. There are a lot of things here which are quite um, risky. There's a big change, and, and we've got a lot of things that have changed very quickly. And so we might not have dotted all the I's and crossed the T's in terms of making sure that people are um, able to do their best work which is a Toyota way of putting it. Um, so what does it all add up to? Um, so really, um, it's understandable, but there is a danger that if all of these things um, um, have, have degraded somewhat, we're actually less effective than we were before. And, and effective is how well we do the job. Um, and so we might have thrived in previously, um, but we, have, we are now in a situation where we are less effective, but we're still efficient. Um, so we, we might, in the worst case, have moved from thrive to die slowly, which is actually, um, and again, we've got a bit of a, a formatting issue. Um, what actually happened to Blockbuster, Walmart, and Kodak, um, and that they ended up doing the wrong thing, but really, really, really well. Um, and none, none of those three are really around. I've got the DVMA up there, which is up there, yes. Um, the DVMA is an interesting one because they don't seem to be doing much well at all at the moment. Um, there are two fundamental inputs to the DVMA. One is um, phone calls, the other is letters. But, but they sent everyone home and stopped opening letters and stopped answering the phones. And they didn't put processors in to manage either of them. Um, I think they've realised now that if they were a commercial company, they'd have gone right back to the origin and died very quickly. Um, so um, it, it, it is very, very easy to get it wrong. Um, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's not an easy one, as the DVI have proven. And even the big companies like Blockbuster and Woolworths, when there was a big change of um, environment, um, they didn't keep up. So it's not easy. Um, again, a bit of formatting issue, but you can see with um, you can see just a bit. So the way forward, um, as I said, it's it's not a right to work from home. So on a one by one basis, what are the options? You know, can someone work from home? Um, consult with each person. What do they want to do? Um, are the policies and procedures um, around their working? Do they stack up still working from home? Um, do contracts need updating? You know, uh, I worked from home for many, many, many months. Um, my contracts at my place of work was 
um, like university. Um, that's fine in an emergency situation, but if that's ongoing, um, it really needs tying up. And, and the big one is, are your systems up to it? Um, and do you need help to revise how you oversee the staff? Um, I've heard of companies putting spyware on company computers so they can see when staff are clicking and see when they're doing stuff. I'd suggest if you need to do that, you're either not leading them in the right way or you've got the wrong staff. Um, but that's a, a, an extreme example. Having said all of that, whatever you take away from it, um, I would say that make an action plan. Um, get help and support on it because what was an emergency situation and you can get away with knife and forking people working from home and, and cobbling together systems and processes um, is not the case because it's clearly going to be the new norm. Um, so I'd say get the help. There's lots of help and, and we all know where to get it from, from, um, from sourcing technology cluster, from uh, um, all of the good people at the bottom there. I only put Samlet um, down there because that's local to here. And I put Coventry and Warwickshire let because that's local to me at home. And even the Institute of Directors, which is having a part. Everyone is there to help and support. But it's um, it's certainly the new normal and it has to be made to work as effectively and efficiently as it, as it possibly can do. So, uh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure we'll do some questions later. I don't know what the format is, but we'll, we'll have to go with that. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Simon Garwell. That was, uh, as usual, you put in so much effort and work into preparing this. And for me, there was quite a few sort of slap head moments and that, you know. Of course it's like that. <laughs> it's very good. Um, we're going to have a, a panel of questions at the end after all the presentations, so I won't ask any questions now or we'll ask questions now. Um, uh, but next we've got uh, Phil Hammett uh, from NPA, please. So, Simon, on. Just like you, I like to wander as well. Um, I'm slightly more vertical challenged this time, so maybe you can actually see me, those people at home as well. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Phil Hammett, Sales and Marketing Director of MPA, and thank you, Pim and Trudy, for inviting me along to talk. You might regret it in a half an hour, but um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about uh, societal change. <laughs> and workplace culture and um, I think it's fair to say that there's never been a time of greater volume variety or velocity of change in, in, uh, in the world um, and, and in the workplace and um, uh, if any of you follow this guy Cold War Steve he's quite the artist uh, does some really good stuff uh, have a look on Twitter if you're bored of what I'm speaking about because uh, I'll know if you're laughing at Cold War Steve uh, obviously um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a crazy old world that we live in, and there's a lot of um, a, lo a lot of change to contend with. And the the, the rate of societal change is, is is never been greater, and it's a difficult thing for leaders to get their heads around. And let's just take one example of so I was talking about in terms of working from home. Uh, right at the start of those first Teams and uh, Zoom meetings. It was all so much fun. Everyone was getting to grips with the technology. Even these people here have made nice little sticks to tell people that they're on mute. Um, give it two months, and uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the Zoom booth rage was really rage going on. You know, was too much noise in the background. The kids are playing dogs barking, or people just breathing far too loud down their microphone. So, um, you know, things changed at a, a rate of knots, and um, it's had a big impact on on workplace culture in general, but specifically, because uh, it's right at the heart of uh, MPA, uh, I wanted to talk about the impact on innovation. So how, how work, workplace culture has changed, um, the, the things that are happening in the world that drive it, and, and how that impacts uh, innovation. And if you look at this great quote here from the Global Innovation Index, um, I'll just highlight the elements which 
are part of workplace culture that have an impact on innovation. So knowledge creation, um, exploration and production of ideas, not just having ideas, lots of companies have an ideas box, which is full to the brim and nothing ever happens. Um, we're talking about the actual production of ideas, the collaboration that needs to happen within the workplace. And uh, you can keep those things in mind as I, as I go through these slides. Um, and as I said, that, that's why we're here at MPA, because our vision is to see a thriving UK economy fueled by innovation and technology. And that's literally all of our services are geared towards that and all of our people are very, very excited about that vision. So we've agreed that innovation is important and there is a huge amount of change in the world. So how can you go about preparing for that change? So a really useful starting point is the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, there's 17 of them, and you just take a, a quick look through those um, on, on the screen there, and you can see that actually using these as a, an anchoring point for your strategy and, and to ask yourself questions in your organisation is a really, really valid exercise. And rooting your strategy in sustainability is, uh, you know, has a really uh, core, has a positive impact on the planet and society. And it also helps your business prepare for extreme events of which, as we said earlier, there, there are many. So it really is a tough time to be a business leader. There's some really obvious issues to navigate. You know, uh, Brexit, COVID-19, uh, container ships running aground from the Suez Canal. Imagine that that would have an impact on everybody. Uh, I think it's spoiled Christmas for some. Um, climate change, I've even put party gate on there. Why have I put party gate? Actually, I think it's a broader issue because it's about the integrity of leadership and, and that's really you know, an important thing for the country. And right at the heart of that, we've obviously the war in Ukraine, but we talk about leadership. You mentioned earlier, Simon, I think we're seeing some really wonderful leadership from Zelensky there and what he's doing, but I digress. Um, it's a tough time to be a business leader and there's some really obvious issues to navigate, as I say, but there's some less obvious ones to do. And that's what I want to focus on today. Some of the less obvious issues that are actually um, quite abundant in the workplace and seem to be under the radar. And those are social media, the impact on the workplace, Gen Z, and the cult of genius. Um, I, I won't bother expanding on those right now. I'll, I'll wait until uh, we go through in a bit more detail. But what I do want to do is build a picture of what each of those changes actually mean for you, how you go about leading your company to make the most of the opportunities they present. And hopefully there'll be some discussion points for in our uh, panel session later, but certainly I think there are going to be some immediate ideas for you to take back to your business. So first off, social media. Um, there's the obvious impact with social media of lost time and productivity. Um, but crucially, what I want, I want to focus on today is how does it affect how people think, feel, and behave? And uh, firstly, let's explore how widespread actually is social media. And <coughs> staggering statistic is that 85% of the UK population actively use social media. Um, and they spend roughly about two and a half hours on social media a day. I did a quick run through of this presentation last night with my uh, 15 year old. Wow, two and a half hours. And then we whipped out his phone. Uh, for those of you who have teenagers, you can whip out the phone, you can see how long they're actually spending on social media. They say it was about double, uh, <laughs> two and a half hours. Um, but crucially, uh, employees access social media while working. 77% of employees say that they access social media while working. So Really, what we're trying to say here is that social media is woven into society, into the fabric of society. And crucially, it's really, really inextricably linked to people's mood. And a um, li little exercise for you, if, if you tend to like to relax on the sofa, scroll through social media at all, uh, do something that will really upset you a little bit, is quickly just switch the screen off and see what is reflected back at you. Because <laughs> kind of look a little bit dead behind the eyes. And this is where this... Uh, this term comes from, which is zombie scrolling. Social media has been, all of the platforms have been incredibly well designed. I really, I just uh, can't see it. Okay, my, <laughs> my, my point. I'll try and come around a little bit. Um, the uh, social media has been really well designed. Platforms are designed to give you just that uh, enough element of variety to keep you searching, 
And you suddenly realize that 15 minutes has just gone, 20 minutes or an hour in some cases. So, um, you know, zombie scrolling, what does zombie scrolling mean? And uh, if you can read that, it's mindless scrolling out of habit with no destination or benefit. So it is amazing how you can get caught into that trap. Everyone can get caught into that trap. And that doesn't actually sound like the ingredients for an innovative workforce. Microsoft dubbed this constant partial attention. So 5% attention here, 5% attention there, and just constantly spreading yourself far too thin. And what that means is that you don't have the kind of concentration that is required for the deep work that really brings innovation in the, in the workplace. Also, a little bit more subtle is that uh, social media drives uh, a need for validation and, and a need for gratification too. And actually these aren't the ingredients of innovation because innovation is about being disruptive, about challenging ideas. And uh, it, it really doesn't set the scene well for innovation in the workplace. And there's a really subtle uh, societal dynamic around well, perhaps during Brexit, we probably saw this most, and it's this concept of Smith. Has anyone heard of Smith? Has anyone heard of Smosting? There's one for you. Smosting is social media boasting. That's all. Oh, look at one you can't. Look at how many how many A's my son got in uh, social media boasting. Smats? No, Smats. So, social media attention seeker. Had a bad day. Dot dot dot. Oh, we had a bad day. Loads and loads of points. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is Smith, and Smith is social media induced polarization. And this is actually really having an impact on society and definitely in the workplace. And it's bad for innovation. It's not just because of polarized views, as I said earlier, around, say, Brexit, Meghan Markle, or how good or bad the ending of Line of Duty was. It's much more significant than that. How does it come about? Well, Social media it really does support confirmation bias, people reinforcing their beliefs. And when people are engaging in social media and putting their view of the world out there, it's, it, they, they are in effectively echo chambers. And this creates these reflexive loops that people get caught in, in their, their ways of thinking. Again, ultimately, what that means for us in the workplace is it limits people's thinking and it reduces collaboration. But crucially, folks are, it, it's like a, an ingrained habit in, in um, the uh, way our brains are activated, which, uh, sorry, are, are, are working, which um, gets people looking constantly for reinforcement and comfort and validation. So those are the downsides, but what can, how can you use social media? And um, there are three overlapping strategies that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, and I should stress that these are, you, you don't have to do all three, you can do one, and they're not sequential. Uh, and you can uh, you can use these to great effect in your business. So explore, co-create, or communicate. So here's a quick example. Um, Nivea, the German, now how would you, uh, my wife said to me yesterday, they're, a, they're not a pharmaceutical company, beauty, beauty brand, Nivea are a beauty brand, oh, no, I think you'd say. And what they did is got huge amounts of customer insight. So, those marketers in the room wouldn't know the focus groups that we tend to use, mirrored rooms, things like that, we would call what people think. Well, it's completely free to access social media and tap into sentiment around certain products, certain things that are happening in society and how you could then build your products and services around it. And what Nivea did is they picked up that um, folk were very happy that they don't have uh, sweaty armpits anymore uh, because uh, antiperspirant is doing a job, but it's leaving, as you'll see in the image, possibly, white stains on your clothing. So Nivea were able to quantify quite how many people were complaining about this on social media. As you say, people put weird things out there on, their, on, social, on social media. But that led them to create a product, um, which is Nivea Black and White. And it's actually one of their best selling products now. And a lot of other companies have followed suit. I think this is where it has a really powerful story. And I, I love this story. This is around co-creation. So co-creation is, is uh, collaborating with customers. It can be collaborating with other companies. It can even be collaborating with competitors using social media as the vehicle to do that. This story is about Ford and how they used um, social media feedback through uh, Facebook, believe it or not, with senior citizens. And the feedback they were getting and that they were looking for was around, uh, what is it like to drive a car? Uh, when, when, as, when you get older, basically, what are the physical limitations, 
what is it like for uh, how is it to use the switch gear in the car etc cetera, etc cetera. and with that feedback ford created what's called the third age suit and the third age suit, I don't know if you can see from uh, uh, how uh, from the screen, but it basically gives people, uh, it gives designers at Ford, it replicates what senior citizens feel like in a car. So with restricted mobility, getting in and out of the car, um, the difficulty with vision, uh, and the difficulty with potentially arthritic fingers using some of the switches and, and bits and pieces in the car. And that's really unlocked much better design in the cars. Then there's communicate, and unfortunately, it seemed like I've got a bit of a zombie fixation, but um, uh, I promise you I don't, uh, but I just try to reinforce that point, um, perhaps. But yes, zombie, uh, um, if you are familiar with Reading, there is a shopping centre, a disused shopping centre in Reading, where you can go and blow up, uh, shoot zombies uh, as, a, as an experience. And yes, uh, it's a, I'm sure you'll be looking it up as soon as we leave. Um, so, it's, it's uh, an experience that was set up around about 10, 11 years ago, and they just weren't getting the footfall they wanted through business, and the business was on shaky ground. They engaged a marketing agency, social media specific marketing agency, and they gave them a very, very small budget to work. So the two guys that ran the agency were sat in the pub where most great marketing ideas happen. They thought, how are we going to get this off the ground? And actually, they pocketed most of that thousand pounds. They didn't have to do too much work for it. They literally got hold of Simon Pegg. Uh, for those of you who know Shaun of the Dead and other great um, comedies and other films as well. Uh, so he is a massive fan and he has about a million followers on Twitter. So they invite Simon Pegg down, take loads of photos, loads of video of his experience. He posts it all over social media. And well, that company is still existing, thriving today. So this is the power of, of this, uh, you know, this, this rapid collaboration and the network amplification of social media. So really when it comes to harnessing the benefits, benefits of social media, it's about having a positive and collaborative, collaborative working environment. And the right working environment is an incredibly important factor for the next societal factor for consideration, which is Gen Z. Now just look around the room. Can anyone name this? Anyone names? I was going to offer a bottle of champagne for it, but, you know, uh, yes, but <laughs> it was too easy. What do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but she did a bond tune, didn't she? The bond tune, the last, uh, last one. So um, there you go, last film. So uh, Gen Z, who are Gen Z? They are digitally savvy, risk averse, mm -hmm. and they are the first global thinking generation. Uh, and Gen Z are going to be a very exciting boost to innovation. So where does Gen Z fit? So uh, born around 1997, 2012. Um, I'm sure everyone's looking at that graph, working out where each of us all fit. Um, and they are currently, Gen Z um, are 10 to 25 years old. So um, this is a really crucial point in terms of uh, the significance of your business is that they're, they're going to be your new cohort of workers in your company. So 27% of the global workforce by 2025. And they are really, as I said, digitally savvy, very, very excited and interested by technology. And technology is their empowerment. And what, in what way is their empowerment? It, it's their way of bringing, bringing about really profound change in the world. Um, and that's how they like to see and use technology. They're motivated by causes. Um, but they have a really, really fine-tuned ear for authenticity. Um, so they care deeply about the purpose and values of the organisations that they, um, they work for. And they will choose an organisation that has got a good purpose and value, an authentic one, over the salary. Uh, they embrace change and flexibility, and they expect open conversations, much around really good collaboration. So you know, this is a framework of a really innovative workforce. There are issues to contend with. And consider. Um, so this generation has seen the most impact uh, from the pandemic um, and psychologists refer to this as COVID scarring um, and you know if we look on the, on the negative side the unemployment rate of that um, the early stage sorry the late stage uh, Gen Zers 
um, is very, very high compared to older generations in the UK. That's particularly because a lot of uh, younger folk are in the uh, hospitality and retail. Um, but it is also because they were the first people, you know, fresh out of university. And unfortunately, they got, they got hit pretty hard by the pandemic and, and job losses. But this is the, the biggest impact of all, is, is the education time was lost. And, and it is pretty staggering. I know that um, that one third is about time in school, but also there's a, there's a bigger picture there, which is a lot of digital learning that a lot of kids had to do uh, during the pandemic as well, which uh, certainly has impacted it. But there's good news too. So in a recent survey of 6,000 university age students, 85% um, feel that they are more resilient and they're more empathetic about um, other elements of society as a result of the pandemic. And really crucial for us all in the room is that 45% of them are really interested in STEM degrees. And the really exciting bit for all of us in terms of can we turn the world around is that the reason they're interested in those STEM education degrees is they want to make a difference in the world. So really, really exciting, as I say, cohort of the workforce coming through. So what can you do? How do you drive innovation to Gen Z as in the workplace? So start with why. Those of you familiar with Simon Sinek's excellent book, um, you know, set a purpose around uh, that, that is authentic and that people believe in and attach all of your decisions, all of your strategy, all the way you communicate, explain why. This cohort are going to be pretty ruthless in terms of determining whether you need it or not. But really exciting, and back to the 17 SDGs, is, is connecting your strategy to the triple bottom line of pro profit, people, and planet. Um, think community rather than workforce. Now, I know I'm guilty. I've used the term workforce throughout the presentation. Um, I sort of think it's fine to refer to it as a workforce, but think community. Think about how you set up offices. Uh, think about how you communicate as an organisation. And think about how people collaborate and how other leaders in the organisation work um because what the gen z is looking for is a much flatter structure um, and much more approachable leaders and support education initiatives um this this generation are really really uh savvy digitally as we said but they're keen to self-start and self-learn so ideas um sorry uh tools such as masterclass linkedin learning etc they're actually quite cheap if you buy them a license to use and they will use it um, so Definitely have a good think about that. And then rethink employment practice. We automatically think that if we need people in a team, we're going to have to have permanent employees. We're going to have to go out and recruit. Actually, Gen Zers want to be freelance. They want to be free to experience different jobs, um, different environments. Um, so um, if you're going to tap into the power of Gen Z, possibly looking at freelance working. So finally, the cult of genius. And what I'm referring to here is society has a knack of overvaluing the spark of creativity, the invention, the seemingly innate talent. Um, just look at any Hollywood movie, um, the montage scene where all of the hard work actually happens is, you know, think of Rocky, think of all of these sort of films. The hard work is just condensed into 30 seconds with a bit of backing music and then they go on and, uh, you know, um, rule the world. What we undervalue then is, is this the graph and the collaboration and failure, the repeated failures, which actually lead to success. And uh, Carol Dweck is a, um, a psychologist and researcher, she's a decade's worth of research and concepts of mindset. She's got a wonderful book called Mindset. And you know, we really put this, uh, we put the mercurial talent on a pedestal. And it's crucial that if you, if you have a, a read of this book, um, it's crucial about how you communicate and how you reward as a leader. It, is, it talks more in terms of as a parent, but actually I think that translates very well to the workplace and uh, how, how you communicate, what you recognise and what you reward. Um, because the danger is that you reward, um, again, seemingly natural talent as opposed to the hard work and the effort. And what it can lead to is, is a fixed mindset. And a fixed mindset is, you know, is, is a very dangerous thing. Um, because it's the sort of thing, the way that, that manifests in an organisation is that, oh, oh, I'm not the creative, or I'm not senior enough to make change, or um, marketing, IT, the R&D department, they're the ones that do the creation and the innovation. 
Um, on the flip side, a growth mindset is all about going towards challenges. It's about having that resilience. Um, and having a, a growth mindset firmly embedded in your organization really does lead the whole organization towards innovating. And you're missing a bit there, but um, in basically this, the, uh, growth mindset, um, not growth mindset, sorry, cult, um, cult of genius wrongly implies that innovation exists solely within uh, dedicated R&D departments. And actually it, it is a whole business um, concern. So the best way of thinking about innovation is rather than it being product led, a lot of folk see the iPhone and think, wow, that's an amazing invention. Look at the innovation that's going to the iPhone. But actually when you consider the software, you consider the operating uh, system, no, sorry, uh, you consider the marketplace in terms of iTunes to be created. There, is, there are innovations right away throughout the organization that actually make that such a viable product. So if every single part of the company uh, was innovating, looking at processes, how it can get better, um, then you really are going to drive value from innovation. So how do you counter this cult of genius? So challenge your own thinking as a leader. We all get caught in a trap of going to the same people to the big ideas or to the same project team to launch the same, uh, to, to launch the next big innovation. Um, recognize and reward company-wide innovation. So we've launched a great scheme for MPA around innovation and recognizing that, um, which I'm happy to talk about in the panel session a little bit later. Um, empower and inspire people to innovate. Now, it'd be great if we all had the budget to bring in uh, James Dyson to, to talk to the entire company and really innovate and inspire them that way. But actually, there's so much that's accessible on YouTube and TED Talks. Make them part of your leadership group meeting. Watch the video together and then review what it means, for example. Bring them into your all hands. There's great ways to bring ex external speakers and inspire people around innovation. And this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, basically talking about genius and innovation, but actually this is the bedrock for your business in terms of innovation, is setting high standards on things that require zero talent. And here's the, here's the list. I, I coach rugby and I talk about this all the time to my team about the things that actually will make the difference. If you get these right, everything else is, is a massive bonus and that's, that's the root of the link performance. So, and a lot of companies get caught in a trap of setting a really grand strategy. They've had a few offsites, they've got a few documents together, here's the big plan, we're going to hit these objectives, we're going to hit these markets. Actually, what we lose is the sight of the day-to-day -day standards as leaders that we reinforce and we hold them to the counter. So, quick recap, there's an awful lot of change in the world, um, uh, but there are an awful lot of threats to consider, but there's a huge amount of opportunities as well from societal change. Uh, so we covered social media, Gen Z, cult genius, and we worked out that Tim's a fan of modern pop, so um, <laughs> we've learned a lot today. Um, it's, the, uh, it's important because we need to set the environment for innovation in our business and gain the competitive advantage or drive for the UK economy. If we can do that, we're not just going to survive, we're going to thrive in this post-pandemic, post-Brexit, post-participate world. Well, uh, thank you very much, Holt. So, <laughs> I've just realised I'm Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot in that, actually. There's a real lot in that. You know, we're going, we seem to be going away from collaborating. We seem to be going away from this sort of flat, open way of running companies and managing. We've got to get that back, really have. Uh, one other thing that came up in one of your slides, uh, the UN goals, sustainability. The sustainability is a profit center for all your businesses if you approach it properly. You've got to embrace it. You know, it's really important. Um, right, that, that's me being on the soapbox. Now it's time for a break. Go and have a cup of tea and everything, and we'll see you back here at uh, 10.45, please. Well, I hope you enjoyed the break. And uh, there's lots of networking going on. Um, now we've got John Henderson from Sarah Penrose uh, talking about how we can utilize our fundamental human skills. So uh, without further ado, thank you very much.
just to provide a little bit of reassurance, I can't do any Madonna impressions. So if you might to stealth um, in a karaoke machine, I can do a good uh, span of ballet. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave the musical stuff to the professionals. But, uh, <laughs> good. Good so, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, John Henderson, and uh, I'm at uh, Sara uh, Penrose Limited. And I'm uh, really very much looking forward to talking today about fundamental human skills. Thank you to him and the team STC for inviting me along to talk, and everybody to registering and uh, come along for the for the conversation. So. So, in terms of just covering the, I suppose, the content, we're going to go into three different areas. Firstly, talk about what we understand for culture change to be, discuss that, introduce the fundamental human skills, uh, and then look at how that potentially uh, can help. So, you'll notice that for the uh, well sort of observant people, there's me holding up the truck in my right hand there, that's me back in the 1980s. My dad seems to be auditioning for a part in Neighbours, not really sure what he's doing with that haircut, but there you go, so well, part of the time. So that leads nicely on to having 25 years experience, which I have in logistics, that's been my, my area of expertise. Um, but in 2018, I co-founded uh, Sarah Penrose Limited with uh, my business partner and wife. Um, Sarah is a chart chemical engineer uh, by profession, and uh, as we are at a, a culture event, I think it's probably worth explaining why we call the business that. Fundamentally, we're very proud of the time that Sarah spent in engineering, and there aren't too many female examples in, uh, in manufacturing engineering still from the name point of view, so we were very keen to push that forward. But also, if you look up at Penrose name, it's very much about the blend of process and creativity um, over the years, and that's fundamentally what we believe in what we do in the business. So I'm, a, I'm also a Charter Fellow of the Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport, which gets me involved in all sorts of uh, shenanigans uh, in logistics operations uh, from across the UK, um, so you can be involved with, understand that piece. Uh, and then I'm also a writer, so I do a little bit of writing for logistics articles, and I'm currently in the process of, of trying to finish, and I really would wish I had finished it, a fiction book, which is just taking forever to do. Uh, done the story, but I keep uh, changing it, so I've got to get to a point where Really must end that book actually, actually but it's been, in, been interesting to do that piece. So I'm uh, I'm proudly uh, East Sussex, I know I live in Northampton and so I'm going to, uh, if you, I've heard all the Southern Softy jokes, I'm not really going to get into those. If you want to know where the North South Divide is, it's Seven Oaks. Seven Oaks is North for me, so I'm going to just clarify that point there. Fantastic. So first of all, really want to talk about, I guess, what is culture? And I suppose we can think about it as being the bones of a business, um, if you like, how a business sort of functions, works, both in terms of humans and both in terms of systems. And there's a, a fairly general sort of definition from for Deloitte that gives you an idea of, of what we mean by, by culture. And I think we want to look at really sort of stepping into what do we, what do we think we understand by the, the term change. And I think what's interesting is that when you start thinking about change and we look to the the slides from the UN pieces for, for some of the drivers, it, it's really sort of multiple, it covers a really broad area, there's lots of different areas which change covers, lots of things to think about, but improvement in there because sometimes we try and make a change for improvement purposes, does it improve, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but I think there's a degree of uncertainty there as well, there's opportunity but it's also uncertainty. So trying to, uh, I suppose, put all together, I guess we've got the idea really of, of, I suppose, moving from a state of the known to the unknown, potentially, when we talk about culture change and putting that all together. And I think the idea is really that, that sort of how does, how does the organisation adapt? How does the organisation change? What the impact does that have on its, its values and its goals? But I'm a great believer in, in understanding so from the bottom up and, and keep it nice and simple. So in terms of what that means for the layperson, it's really, the idea that, that changes the way uh, things have been done in the business for a key defined reason to meet a specific objective. And that's really what, uh, what we, we understand by the term culture change. Now, the fun bit, the challenge. This is a much quoted quote from Henry Ford that he didn't actually say, but I think I quite like it. So <laughs> <laughs> if there's anyone from Ford to leave the theme here, I'm happy to 
we'll discuss that afterwards. But uh, yeah. so I think the idea is, you know, you come up with something new, people he was really buzzing about it, really want to talk about it. Um, did he make a success of the business? Draw your own conclusions. But ultimately, people just wanted something the same, but a little bit different, but to move forward. So this idea of trying to trying to get change going um, and trying to embed it is, is a really a real difficult challenge. And I think I think part of that part of that piece there is is that idea of navigating uncertainty to, to achieve what we want to achieve. Excuse me a second. I think I try to think of a good example of, of how that kind of works. And I think back to we used to have Asda as a customer and uh, we used to frequently go up to Leeds to the head office. And I went with a colleague and we stopped at a mobile service station in Stroud Services in the M1. And they had a great, wonderful banner for these new low salt, low fat chips. Really lovely banner, all fantastic. They've obviously spent a fortune on it on the marketing. So my colleague went, yeah, quite fancy those. We'll give them a go. Went over, went over to buy them, sort of sorted up, really hungry. I said, oh, to the person, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're, they're any good. And the response was, no, it tastes like cardboard. <laughs> so <laughs> somewhere that's failed. That company spent a fortune on that, but you know, you could look at the reasons why that person's not necessarily engaged, but hasn't gone down to the, the shop floor. Maybe they did taste like cardboard. I don't know. I didn't try them, but I think you know, ultimately, mm -hmm. we don't get the buy in. Um, we've, we've got a real challenge uh, to, uh, again to sort of move forward. And I think where that kind of comes into is what I call the, sea, excuse me, the seesaw problem. Which is this idea of as humans, we, we really want the excitement. We love that idea, as long as it's no different, safe and proven. So we want the change, but we kind of don't want the change. We're kind of stuck on this bit of a seesaw, etc. in terms of what that looks like. Back to the Henry Ford moment, again, similar sort of, similar sort of explanation. Okay, so um, I guess therefore we want to look at really thinking about why does culture change? Um, I think we've seen for the last two years, you know, really certain factors have come in and have caused that to, to sort of change the way we think. I think there's a, there's a variety of different areas, but I think what it, what it tends to suggest is that it, it's kind of multiple and it's, it's constant. We can't avoid that. I think what's the saying that you know, the only constant thing is change along those lines. So it's always going to be there. We're not going to be able to avoid it. So we have to think, well, how do we manage that? How do we embrace that going forward? And I think um, the other thing to bear in mind is it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to change the way we do things, to make things different, to improve on things, and perhaps to challenge things that we've done for a long period of time, because we've all done it like that, ultimately. And then we think about, I suppose, why is change difficult? Um, and I think, again, there are numerous reasons why that takes place, but it's things like people being too ambitious about what they're trying to do, not necessarily defining the scope, poorly communicated, fear. I think there's, a, there's another piece about it, which is to do with, I suppose, historical. You know, has the company done a, a change program in the past that has worked? Was everybody involved? Was it a disaster? Whether that be internal, whether that be in the media? So, Again, there's always this resistance. There's always a bit of a challenge to do this piece. Um, but as we can see, you know, from from the work from Bain and Company, you know, it's a real concern. We don't have the, the, the abilities as, a, as an organisation to change and move that forward. And I guess if you look at it, also, you can probably you can probably all identify that there's at least one, if not multiple, reasons there which are causing what transformational projects, if you like, to come to a grinding halt. And that's often why that why that tends to take place. So, how do we improve change? I think one of the pieces I want to try and get across today is it's a concept, it's pretty simple, but it's the idea of just being better at it, being better at the process of change. Um, you know, it's not, not particularly complicated. How can we replicate it? How can we confront the barriers to stop the, the how do we get to the, we've always done it like this. How do we, how do we get into that, that sort of change uh, and, and really challenge that? And I think it's that really about creating the conditions to change. So can we create an environment where we can see change, but in a safe, uh, safe place, but it's outside of a comfort zone? It may sound like a bit of a contradiction, 
But what we're interested in, we want to replicate the change so we can see how people respond to it, how they act, how they how they uh, work under those conditions, and what that does in terms of mindsets and, and skills going forward. So, see really much, very much about seeing how people respond uh, and people act to that, uh, and people act as a result of that. But then, if we look at that, we think about riding a bike. Do we do that by PowerPoint, learning how to ride it, or do we do it by doing it? And I think, you know, this is a... I actually only learned to ride a bike in my 20s, um, which was really annoying. So I was trying to ride around on a bike, all over the place. There were loads of kids laughing at me in the park, it's hilarious. Um, so it was quite painful that day. I don't wish to share that so much with you today. But I think it's that idea that learn by doing piece. You know, if we're, if we're, gonna, we're gonna say that we, we've identified the change is difficult. So therefore, how do we replicate that? And how do we do it by actually doing it? Uh, and that's, you know, ultimately sort of some of the things we've been thinking about in preparation for today's session. So, what are fundamental human skills? Essentially, it's no great wizardry to this. So this is about thinking, creating and solving, essentially. These are all skills that are associated with humans. These are all human skills. These are all things that humans traditionally are very good at. So think about the complex and the context. So we take an example of a, a picking operation in an automated warehouse. There's a great deal of processes required for a picking operation to be able to automate it from an automation point of view, determine a, a different range of brands. So let's say, for example, that the item is Hobie's brown bread. From a human point of view, the human will know it has to substitute it, that it can have another range of brown bread. But the system needs time and effort to work on that to be able to understand what that means. Now, it's a pretty bad example, but the point being is humans have that context piece. Humans have that, that understanding of the complexities of that, whereas automation is really very much geared towards the repetitive and making things more efficient over a long period of time. So I think where you look at where that sticks, I think the good thing to consider is that these skills are uh, permanent and they're also transferable. And I think one of the interesting aspects is that technical skills on average is the three year lifespan. Whereas these sort of skills uh, are for life, for career wise, and ultimately can be improved uh, and changed during that, during that process. And I think also there's a, the idea of specific and transferable, and that's not a contradiction. So if your job is analysis role, data analyst, then the idea of critical thinking to identify the value in uh, in something and take the value out and, and, and capture that, which you know we're all overloaded with data, so the ability to find that value is the key thing. That is specific to that role, whereas a management role, if you're looking at something broader, if you want to understand how to, how to look at sort of project scope, etc., it's more of a transferable skill. So it's both specific and also transferable. Um, so. Let's talk a little bit more about what they actually what those skills are and essentially critical thinking is 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 literally finding the value in something you know we all talk about this obvious but we've seen lots of social media posts lots of elections have been won on enough information that people haven't checked but also if you look into a lot of business cases there's a lack of understanding of the value of something because we haven't gone into the details to ask the questions we talked about why earlier on asking the questions getting there well what how does that work what's that about digging in a bit of detail but forming those those sort of reasons and unbiased arguments, you know, the value proposition in the chain of the chain of command in the business, so that the supervisor can speak to a, a manager and talk in great detail about, well, this is what I think, this is why I think it. I've done my research. This is what I want to do. Move forward. That's a positive place to be. But this is com this is, this is complementary with lateral thinking, which is about really the unconventional. It's about stepping outside of the known. It's about doing something a little bit different. And that forms the basis of using curiosity and imagination, which ultimately uh, is really very much sort of pinned by the use of creativity in a business. And I think it's this idea of, of uh, embracing uncertainty, taking on uncertainty, say stepping outside the comfort zone in order to get into that place where you can start to think differently about what you're trying to do. And that's all tied together with problem solving, which is very much about the act, how, how we do that, how we put that together, we measure it, we control it, we, we manage it. So, where do fundamental human skills originate from? Well, funnily enough, it's the US Army. 
So the US Army were concerned that their uh, recruits, et cetera, were needed more skills than just the ability to drive a tank or fire a gun. So they actually worked on uh, what they became called systems engineering and training. And that became the skills to be able to write reports, the skills to be able to assess information. And that was where the term soft skills ultimately comes from, which I'll come to in a second, if I may. So I think one of the pieces to consider is, and this is always a big, big discussion point, this idea of skills or behaviour. So I suppose what we're trying to say is that the, if we look at the soft skills piece, that is a mixture of behaviours and skills, certainly. But if you look at the original US Army definition, that was about skills. Um, you know, so ultimately, there's been a slight change of what the definition means. And I think this is an important point for, from, uh, from my point, is that skills transcend behaviour in the sense that um, if you're improving, if you're improving your capability, and someone's improving their capability at task, that improves their confidence, which also changes their behaviour. So there's a distinct pattern of how that works. But this is about skills. It's not about saying that behaviour activity is not important. Of course it's important. But I'm only focusing on fundamental human skills of the definition and what that means uh, today. And when we talk about skills, we talk about human skills. We're then looking at emotional intelligence. So to put it all together, fundamental human skills are practical skills which are designed to improve business performance. It's a critical thing for natural people problem solving. So just trying to define where that sits. Nothing wrong with behavioural activities, that's absolutely key. There are some key skills here, which are human skills, fundamental human skills, which can be used for improving performance in the business. But it is, it's, it's not about saying you, you can you know, learn to think. Everyone can think. We can all do that. We can all think, we can all create, etc. I like this idea we talked about earlier on the human road, innovative or not innovative. Well, humans don't really work like that. If you can imagine and if, you can, if you're curious, you've got creativity. It doesn't matter what form you do it in, we're all, we're all able to do it. This idea that we are or we're not, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a bit simplistic view to some respects, in some respects. And this idea of the practicing being better, it's about practicing, it's about really getting the, um, the experience. Why, why do elite sports people practice? Why do they train? Because they want to get better at it. So it's not teaching some teaching people to suck eggs, it's improving the way we do things. So, are you awake? Okay. But what does this comedy sketch say about communication, essentially? What does it say about it? So you've got a chap trying to buy something, he's not sure, he's not communicating it pretty well, the guys behind him doesn't really get it, gets annoyed, they both get annoyed, they waste a lot of time. It's hilarious, I, I crap every time I watch it. But let's look behind it. Is that an effective transaction? Probably not. Um, is it obvious what the problem is? Maybe it isn't. Do we make lots of assumptions? And I think this is the challenge with, you know, understand the assumption people understand things. You know, if, you, if you're using critical thinking, you're asking questions. So when you're asking questions of somebody, it's as much a challenge for them as it is for you. But it's an opportunity for them to think, well, have I got that right? Well, I understood. Does it make sense? Does that memo make sense? Does that policy make sense? Does that statement make sense? Well, it's obvious. Is it? And I think this comes back down to the, the idea of some, some delivery pieces. I'm keen to, to get some, some actions into what we're talking about. So essentially, the use of a skill created task is a real opportunity to recreate that need for change. Because what you're doing is this, that's a core human activity. We all talk about the water for the moment which is about how do we replicate those moments that we can create, we can come together and come up with ideas. And it's very much back to first principles. You're taking something apart. If you look at the definition of the word analysis, it is about loosening throughout, that's what it means literally. You take it back to first, first principles, you understand it from the beginning, you can take it back and build it back up again. And where this is crucial is this idea that people have got this, I've never, I've never done it, all. it's a long time since I've done this. So, you're actually challenging people to do a task they've not done. So you're replicating what you want to do as a change. You're doing it in a safe environment, but it's outside the comfort zone. So they're doing something they haven't done. It's, it's completely controlled and safe. That's the great thing about a creative exercise because there's nothing, you can't get anything wrong. You've got boundaries out of the way, boundaries are out of the way, that's fine. You can get on, you can actually get to the detail of what you want to try and do. And, and I think Phil touched on it earlier, so I do exploration, the idea to explore. The idea to experiment to trial and error, perfectly safe. Um, from Sarah's experience working in, in process engineering, if you did a test and you got it wrong, you blew up half of Northamptonshire. 
So, yeah, it's always quite good and a safety point of view to do a, a test offline, etc. The other thing to consider is you could say, well, why don't we just move the process we do into a workshop and do the, the training? Fine. But then you've got the same process again. So all you're doing is giving someone a task they already do. Why, why would you do it? If you want to change the way they think, why would you give them something they already do? It doesn't make sense from, from, from my viewpoint. I think also it's immersive. We talked about social media. We talked about the challenges associated with that. Um, so ultimately, you've got everybody focused on what they're doing. Uh, and they're safely out of that comfort zone, as I say. Briefly, when we talk about kids, what do they do all day? Curiosity, imagination, play, no barriers, perfect. But also, are they not good at managing change better than adults probably are? Yeah. Why is that? That's a good question then. We get to a certain point where we don't think we should do that anymore. And there's a condition in place, which is interesting. Last point on that is this idea of dominating their well, I don't know, Claire, that's not a, a sort of text club reference, just to be absolutely clear on that. So, <laughs> I realise that, so I've just read that. I've read too well. What I mean by that is the idea that people take over. So if you have a, a go-kart day, and someone takes over, if it's, a, if it's a day you want to do a team build, you know, mm -hmm. so therefore not everyone gets involved. Well, with a skill creative task that you control in a workshop, everybody's got to do their own thing. Everybody's got to contribute. Nobody can dominate. So you get to see a lot more about what people do and how they act. This is a piece about creativity and process. It's the combination of the two. So lateral thinking is open the mind, the unconventional, outside the box, but the critical thinking is then pinning it down. So someone talked about, we can have loads of ideas, that's great, but how do we manage those ideas? How do we assess what the right ideas are? If you have 50 ideas, you can only come forward with four, which is the best one. So you need that level of structure, idea, process, and creativity. The combination of the two, that's obviously essential in day-to-day -day working environment. Excuse me. So um, I suppose it's just have a look at why, why I sort of train uh, to do this. And I think that piece is really all about um, stimulating a transformational process. So you are trying to recreate the situation. What you're, what you're doing is you're observing how people respond to change. If they begin the task to do, they've not done it before, or they've had that phase to go. You can watch, you can observe, how do they act, what do they do, uh, what skills can be applied, and then you can use those skills ultimately in the transformational process you're looking to do. So you're almost running a bit of a simulated test piece to, to do that. And I think the other piece to consider is that you are making a commitment to the people in the business, that you look recognize that you're not just going to implement something, you're going to actually work on it first, so that people are far more on board and they understand what you're trying to do. Back to the four candles to get time. We've assumed he knows what he's doing. They, neither of them are communicating very well at all. <clears throat> Some Jack. I think the, uh, the thing is that, and this is absolutely key, the unconventional is not managed conventionally. You, you, you can't, if you want to change what you're doing, you, you can't use the same, well, we're going to do it like this. Well, you won't because that's not how it works. Otherwise, you could carry on doing it the same way you've done it. So you almost have to take a bit of a leap of faith into that. Think, right, what do we want? How do we, how do we change? If we want to replicate change. How do we do that? What you quote James Dyson, this idea of that freedom, that freedom to do that. Freedom of a creative exercise allows you to do that. It allows you to do that as long as you measure it, you're monitoring it, and you take the value from it. I think that's absolutely key. I'm just mindful of the time here at the moment, so not too much longer. Looking just at applying the piece, and I think this is where it's vital. It's not just about, it's, it's not about somebody being the next Claude Monet. That's not what we're looking at doing. What we want to do is to see how somebody actually performs by undertaking a task they've not done. That's what we want to see. We want to see how do they act, what do they do, and that can tell you how they pay them, how they will um, perform in a transformational change piece. It's a great way of replicating that piece. But you need to apply that to the day-to-day. -day. Otherwise, if you don't apply it, you've got the, you've got the risk of um, you don't measure it, you can't, you can't see what the benefit of it was. So you've done the exercise, but you've done all the hard work, you're not going to have to apply it. And I think it's also about running it before the transformational change because then you can see what did you learn? What can you apply to the actual live process going forward? We talk about measure. I'm sorry about the uh, piece on that. That's question, analyze, innovate, solve, review. So, you know, in, our, in the workshops that we do, that's what we do. Question, analyze, uh, question, analyze innovate, solve, review. Constantly, constantly, constantly. Now we can measure as people do that, how they do it and what stage they do it in the workshop. That's vital information for companies to understand more about the people and how they react in that particular piece. I will just say that 
um, the drawbacks of team building days, what, what were you going to do? What was the purpose of the team building day? And what did you do with it? Otherwise, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a fact, 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 frankly, an expensive job if you're not careful. And that can often be the case. Um, and, and also say that the numbers there for people not particularly liking team building days, that's the position of, well, I don't really want to get into a, a sweaty go-kart and drive around the field in Norfolk. You know, well, fair enough, that's not what you want to do, it's not what you want to do. So got to be mindful of what we're trying to create, how we do that piece. And so what, similar to the point that uh, we made earlier on, these are all companies that have partly, due to the lack of ability to manage the culture change, are no longer with us. Um, so not solely, but partly. And that's really why, where do you want to be in five years time, ultimately? So in summary, uh, culture change is challenging, culture change is unavoidable, but culture change is an opportunity. Uh, humans have the ability to embrace any transformational change and fundamental human skills to actually support that change. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, just one little word of warning, by the way, for doing sort of team away days. If you've got motorsport people, <laughs> don't take them on a karting day, for God's sake, because they all think they're Kimi Raikkonen and slipstreaming Michael Schumacher into a rouge, and you'll end up with a fight. <laughs> they're all useless. You just bring out people's ruthlessness. But no, really interesting insights there. Thank you very much for that. Um, next, we've got Ali King Smith from uh, Clearworks Coaching. Uh, the transformational impact of building a culture where leaders coach rather than tell. Uh, um, this is something I'm really looking forward to with my senior management. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, my first job is to give a bit of feedback according to the UN Sustainable Development Goal on gender that podiums across the world are built from blokes. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm a little bit behind podiums, so I might break the rules and go for a little walk around there. But, um, Really great to be here. Thank you for asking us to come along and congratulations to whoever created the flow of the day because it really is a build one on the other on the next. So thank you to the people that come before. I'm Ali King Smith and my world is behaviour change, leadership development in the world of STEM um, and also culture change. So for us, culture change is about changing a series of micro behaviours within an organisation such that everybody becomes different so that um, leadership can can push that to change. The focus for today is looking at what's happened a wee bit in the workplace changes and how a coaching stance, how looking at that from an asking perspective rather than a telling perspective can make all the difference in the world. I'm so excited by some of the messages that I heard this morning. My mission is to try and stay on what I'm supposed to be talking about and not get carried away and overexcited, but I'll try and make some links back to what's come before. The role of listening in wellbeing and retention. Um, so I posted on LinkedIn a wee while ago, um, one of the great privileges of my life is that I sit as a coach with leaders globally from all sorts of different sectors. We focus on the STEM sector. I posted about my concern about the, the level of burnout and exhaustion and stress that I'm experiencing in leaders. I'm quite old now, so I've been doing this job for a long time and I've never experienced anything like it. And I got an absolute deluge of responses, mostly from coaches who are experiencing the same thing. And I think some research will come out soon. Somebody's going to have to do something quick because there's something really bad going on in the, the uh, wellness of the leaders. And it's because of this massive accelerated change that's going on. And all of it is new. Nobody knows what they're doing. Anyone who's on LinkedIn saying that they're an expert in hybrid working, they can't be because it's only just happened. So we're all throwing track down in front of the train trying to work this thing out. The psychology of belonging is something I was taught about in coach school, and I knew it was important, but recently it's been absolutely building belonging on purpose in order to solve this problem that we're coming across. So I'd like to share with you just a, a case study of how we've used the psychology of belonging to bring groups together. We talk about group coaching, but actually how that can empower this change. So if I take you back to my start, when I started my business, I looked at how organisations were built, boss at the top, triangular structure, everybody underneath. So I built my business like that. I had my idea and then I recruited people um, as a freelance team, taught them about my idea and helped them to help me. And that's how we structured the organisation. And that's how many, many organisations are still structured. 
people below, below the boss, taking instruction, being told what to do and delivering to a better or, or worse extent. What happened was pretty quickly, I got absolutely exhausted with holding that big, big idea and having the big ideas and feeding those big ideas down to people who were all brilliant, but I was limiting the where, where we could go by being that way. So I flipped it the other way up, such that I recruited only people who were better than me at everything. So I put myself at the bottom and my idea at the bottom of it, flipped the triangle the other way up, so that everyone around me could be driving the thinking forward. At that point, I realised that coaching is not just a nice to have, it's a performance stretch, it's a push towards other people's thinking. So when I'm talking about coaching, I'm talking about having other people think better, so enabling people to do their best thinking. So just before I run into this, can I just ask in the room, is there anyone here who is either named a coach or mostly coaching as their, as their job job? So nobody in the, in the room. So is anybody using a lot of coaching a lot of the time already? Pretty, yes, yeah, so we've got some, some mostly coaching type of stance. I think a lot of us do without even realising we're doing it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And is there anyone that thinks, no, probably I'm not too sure what you mean exactly by coaching. I know it's a good thing, possibly, but I'm not doing much of it in my day job. So a little bit of that. Okay, perfect. So we've got all sorts of here. <laughs> so if I link it back to the revolution in the workplace, there's a really good article out at the moment in Harvard Business Review um, in March called Managers Can't Do It All. I've, I've got the link in the slide deck um, when you get the slides afterwards. It mentions four big business movements. I think it's a really useful way of looking at the way that coaching is finding its place. So re-engineering, this was 1990 to 2000. This was about process re-engineering. So this was the emphasis in business was global reorganization of the processes and stopping managers holding the process and going more global with the way that the organizations were set up. That meant that managers managed uh, in a more process focused way. <laughs> Towards the millennium, digitalization started to take over. What this meant was democratization of information. So the CEO could speak straight to all the people. So no longer did you need that funnel pushing information down through an organization. Structures got flatter and digital communication started to drive that the way that people led. Later in the 2010s, the agile movement. This was all about shortening timelines, turbocharging innovation, getting it to speed up, teams forming, breaking, forming, breaking across organizations quickly, such that your loyal experience with your manager and your lifelong attachments to your, to your relationship or your chapter long relationship was broken. So people were not being able to manage in the same way through loyalty anymore. The next big movement it describes as flexible working. So this was coming in the, in the early 2020, 20, late 2010s, and then was pushed onto the desk in March 2020, go flexible working, bang, they were gonna do it. And people, some people were more ready than other people. The gig economy was in the press, people were talking about it, but we didn't really get it. When flexible working came, the management techniques that were working before are absolutely exactly as you were describing first thing this morning, useless. They just couldn't work in the same way that they did before. So the three dimensions of change that describes that article are the changes to power of the way the leaders um, work across the organisation, the skills that were needed and the structures of the team. So I'm focusing on the people part of that, the human part of that. In the um, article, they, they report talking to 60 organisations about what they thought the key things to focus on at the moment were, and they described coaching, communication and well-being as the absolute key focuses for organisations at the moment. So if I look at what I mean by coaching, so when I'm talking coaching, this is what we're talking about. If we look, I'm going to move away from my big white block, and um, if I think, if I'm down here as coach, um, my behaviours as coach are all in the asking. I am curious, I'm um, giving you the ability to tell me what you think and to turn up with your brain switched on. If I move to this end of it by direct, I own the top of the triangle, the stuff, and I throw it at you and you catch it if you want to. If I happen to have engaged you luckily by what I'm throwing at you, I get you to come with me. 
or not. The point being, if I'm at this end of the line, I'm not doing so much thinking, you are. So I'm giving all the weight of the work to you to do the thinking. If I'm at this end of the spectrum, I'm owning all the thinking of the work and I'll just chuck it at you. So you'll either do it or not do it without the thinking part. So as a leader, you get to choose whereabouts on that spectrum you are. I put the word mentor in there because people wonder where coaching and mentoring is linked. To be a mentor, I need to have done it myself before. So I need to be able to say, I tried this, this is what I'd recommend. At the direct end of mentoring, I'd say, I've done it before, this is what I think you should do. At the coaching end of mentoring, I'd say, I've done it before. Would you like to explore what you think about this before I throw my stuff at you so that I give you the chance to switch your brain on fully before I chuck it all at you, <laughs> if that makes sense. So we have a choice all day long of what we're being when we're being a leader as a coach. And my, it's not, this is not me saying coach all of the time or direct all of the time. The point is to be flexible about where you're hanging out in any given moment on that spectrum. So if we link that spectrum to a curiosity judgment spectrum, I would say that the coaching end of the spectrum is staying in the curious, staying in the questions, staying in the what if, in the not knowing. At the other end of the spectrum, the judgment is, this is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is false, more binary in its approach. Um, and so anytime that you feel yourself getting too far into the directive, it's pretty easy, quick fix to move oneself to the other end of the spectrum. Just think, let's get more curious. Let's stop judging. Let's stop knowing. Go back to the not knowing and get curious. The ICF definition of coaching is pure coaching. Are you freezing? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, it's fine. No one else needs to bother them. Happens <laughs> really forget to speak. So the um. The ICF is the International Coaching Federation. Their definition is about partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspire them to maximise their personal and professional potential. Now, I like this idea that it's creative and it gets the thinking to be more creative. The link between asking questions and producing innovation is tight. The link between sending people to work from home and not having these open conversations and innovation dropping is also tight. So I'm wondering at the moment where the innovation is going as we're having people here into their own homes and not coming together. The so leaderless coach is obviously going to be a bit different. The leader has still got their own held objective. They've got to get people to an outcome that they want them to get to, otherwise they're not using them in the same direction. But still, I would say, keep the curiosity and the not knowing in mind. Take a coaching stance. So, a coaching culture sounds very complicated. You can pay a lot of money for a lot of consultants to come and help them build a coaching culture within your organisation. And certainly there are complex ways to do that. But I'm on the hunt for how to drive a coaching culture without having to bring in consultants, without having to change much at all. And I would say it all comes down to that shift in stance for everybody. So the key parts of it would be to increase one's own flexibility, your own questioning skills, your own curiosity first. And then the push of this um, thinking is to bring people together in their own mini culture, mini communities across the organisation to think together and to help each other travel along as a community. So the word community and belonging becomes very important in building cultures. I was interested as I drove into the tech cluster, it says connect, succeed, belong. I saw the word belong as I came in, it's going to be the word for 2023. I tell you, the people are going to need to feel like they belong because we've just gone across the globe into our own little corners of the world. So I'll come in a minute to why belonging matters to humans because it definitely does. If you're looking to make a shift in culture, changing micro behaviours a bit at a time will move the culture from this to that. So we, we, when we're working on culture change, we might go from, say, a culture of suspicion moving from suspicion to trust, what actually has to happen, what behaviours have to be like in order to move from one thing to the next. So for a culture culture, it might be to move from judgment to curiosity. Let's stop knowing and let's go to the not knowing. Let's move from telling people to asking people. Move around from running around, doing things, to stopping and thinking and letting people think and enabling people to think better. 
The idea of KPIs and annual appraisals is going to be smashed to pieces by Gen Z. They're not going to put up with it. They're going to want regular, in the moment feedback. The conversations are going to be key. Not just Gen Z who care now about purpose, and, and we know how important that is for them, but you've got your um, really great to link everything back to what you're saying to your Gen Z. But the, this um, culture of leaving that we've got at the moment, the great resignation, I've been reading about the great resignation. People generally have had time to think, what do I care about in this great mass of horror that we had happening in the world? And now Putin's making his move. What do we what do we care about? And people are not going to stay in jobs that they don't really passionately and <coughs> from their own personal person. So until we put humans and our conversations with every human in our team back on the table or back in the room, we're not going to be able to make those purpose-led conversations and have a, coach, a culture of coaching. This manager is boss, the triangle being that way up, that's going to have to change into empowered thinkers and doers doing it for themselves. And people are stopping putting profit first and they're putting their well-being first. And if they're not, they're breaking down. Burnout is going wild. So we're going to have to be putting well-being before profit across the board. I'm going to now just talk a moment about status as its own topic, because one of the things that coaching does is, is balances out the status in the conversation. So where we've had a statusful boss who knows the stuff and the people in the team who know less and that balance of status being that way so we can follow the leader with status. Coaching puts everybody's status to be equal. It means that people will switch their brain on more. They'll contribute to the conversation. They'll call it out when there's an error about to happen. They'll tell the captain that the Titanic's about to hit the iceberg. That, all those stories we hear about people not having psychological safety to speak up. There's a chap who's made a name for himself, David Rock, who I thought was a neuroscientist, but he's not. He's a very clever marketeer who's looked at what the neuroscientists studied. So good luck to <laughs> David Rock. He's done a good job of gathering the data together. He looked at the neuroscience of reward and threat for the human. So if I just explain for a moment what, what I'm talking about with that. In response to stuff happening to us, a human will, will mount a response. If it's good stuff, like sweets, happy stories, nice bosses, successes, we'll get a pouring of serotonin, oxytocin through our body, we'll feel better and our behaviours will be better. We'll listen better, we'll be more likely to be engaged, we'll be more positive to our peers and so on. If bad stuff happens, like there's a bear coming into our cave, or we get some rough feedback from a grotty manager, or, um, or some other things are happening which, which are bad for us. And I'll go through the five key ones that David Rock found to be the most awful ones for humans. We will mount a threat response. And in a threat response, cortisol pumps, we start to get into a stress state and our behaviors get bent out of shape. We'll stop listening, we'll start fighting, we'll start defending. And, and everything gets a little bit worse. So the neuroscience has proved that the five things which humans mount the most threat response to are threats to these things. Our status, not necessarily are we the boss, but where do we fit in here? Do I know how I sit in this community? Am I safe here in this group? Certainty. So, I mean, heaven knows, look at the Earth at the moment and what, what's going on. We don't even know if there's going to be a planet, never mind whether we're going to be part of the European Union. So, Certainty is way under threat for all of us at the moment, meaning pretty much the whole community is in a state of slightly more cortisol than usual. So if you're hearing people say, my team's being crankier than usual, or everybody seems a bit um, under the weather, we're all a bit full of cortisol at the moment. Autonomy is about having choicefulness for one's own things to go right. So being able to be choiceful about where we end up, what happens for us. Relatedness, I'll come back to specifically, is this belonging. Do I relate to people? Do I fit in here? Am I safely held? And fairness is what it says on the tin. Some people will have a stronger justice team than others. I don't know who else suffers with a terribly strong justice team. I have to fight the good fight. Struggle is real for me. But fairness across anybody um, will elicit a response if it's under threat. There's a nice sweet exercise that I do with clients if they're feeling awful which is the scarf self-monitoring thing. You can, you can do like a bar chart 
um, of how is your how is your status, how is your certainty, how is your autonomy, your relatedness, or your fairness. And just think about what which of these could be really under threat for me at the moment. Where could I drive something up? Where could I improve it? Because the higher the line here, the less cortisol, the more oxytocin you've got in your body. The lower it is, the more under threat you're feeling, and potentially you could be mounted in response to that. If you've got someone in your team who's really out of whack and you just can't put your finger on what's going on for them, just do it for yourself quietly. Just what could be going on here? Where could they be feeling lonely or under threat or criticized? Or you're, where's the, that threat coming from for them? Potentially raising your awareness to their, their behavior. So, so what? When I was doing my coach training, I had a moment of inspiration by a brilliant tutor, Damien Hughes, who um, you might have heard, he's, he's a sports psychologist originally at Man United and now he looks after the Scottish rugby team. Um, and he drew these dots on a flip chart. These are people randomly floating, don't belong to anyone, have no connection with each other. They're just out there. All you have to do is give them a shared purpose to bring them together. Tell them what their purpose is, or I sort of beg pardon, ask them what their purpose is and align your where you're trying to get them to with their purpose of where they want to go. Suddenly you've got what I would describe as a community. We used to talk about it as a tribe. Actually, we, people are giving feedback that the word tribe is, is not helpful, that people who do come from indigenous tribes would like us to stop using the word tribe. So I choose not to use that word anymore. But building communities that way, as a set of behaviors. Setting the rules. How does this community want to be with each other? How can we make each other feel safe? So specifically addressing David Rock's list. How can it be fair? How can people have choiceableness and so on? And giving each other some equal status. The joy of this community is then in the shared energy that comes from each person in the community. Where, for example, on any given day, this pink dot could be the leader. This person's got a great idea. Let's follow that way because that person's in charge today. Mm -hmm. On a different day, it's her over there or him over there. We want to go this way. Today, they're the leader. And this community moves around together as a cohort. And in service of your question, John, around what's going to help now, my belief is that this is what's going to help now. Building, belonging, community, small cohorts of people who travel along together is what's going to bring that sense of belonging because humans seek it out. If you look at any of the psychology models that exist out there. Maslow, I'm sure everybody's heard of Maslow. The human givens, that's a set of, of 10 specific requirements that humans have all those things, they're in balance, that, that they feel mentally well. That includes relatedness, belonging. Mere givens, the needs of children, belonging is in there. It really, really matters to us. If you can build the psychology of belonging in a group of people, help them feel as if they're trusted, they have a shared person purpose and the travel along with the community. You've got a really low cost way of breaking down silos, bringing people together. Imagine if say you had a group of developers and marketeers who didn't compete, physicists and biologists who could be friends. So people who came together in groups, imagine what that could do. I got really inspired by that and started building coaching groups on purpose. And much of my career has been about building coaching groups. We now call them Clear Works Coaching Circles. And we took them in this the case study into a biotech pharmaceutical company in Basel. So one of the big guns would know them. The problem they came to us with was that they were losing women from the top of the pipeline. So this is just one specific problem. It could be people were feeling lonely, or it could be that innovation had dropped off. It doesn't matter what the problem is, but that we used it to address this one problem. We had to, we didn't have to know why they were losing women from the pipeline. The women were sure as eggs know why they were losing the pipeline. We didn't have to go hunting to find that out. So we moved to a place of not knowing and we just decided to build belonging between them. So we knew we had women in a men's world over there. So we had one head of logistics who was female, everybody else were female fellas. And we had a um, head of physics that was female, so, so on across the whole organization. Some of them face-to-face -face and some of them online. We purposefully brought them together. We asked them what they would like to think about. So we put six women together with one coach and we called it the six by six. So we built six women for six months with the same coach, bum, 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 bum. And then after we, we've done that, we've now left them to it, but they're doing it themselves in the organization. 
we did that in one place and then in another place and in another place so now we've created what i would describe as a movement so everyone in these groups has been through this process where they've agreed what are the rules of this community each group has agreed their own rules of the community and now we call them the alumni so everyone who's been through a circle is connected with everyone else who's been through a circle and we're now lifting that as a process and using it in different organisations in the same kind of a way. So building groups and moving people along together. It's something that any organisation could do. Oh, right. Am I running late? No, no, no. All oh, good. So what happened was in the first year of doing this, retention improved by 40%. People stopped leaving. We didn't ask them why they were leaving. They just stopped leaving. And the feedback they were giving was very human centered so it was i could think differently i could learn from others i was inspired by other people's honesty i got braver in my conversations i stopped wasting time i got the promotion i decided to stay and go for the role so there's something there about the autonomy that was reclaimed and the status that was shared across the group so just imagine in an organization putting together as we did in one of the catapults the ceo with a baby techie in the same group imagine how that drives the communication and the team building across the whole organization just smashes silos down because the status is removed historically in training programs you would have taught the senior leaders and you would have taught the aspiring leaders they would not be in the same room together and it's really really odd things this model at the side this was just the thematic coat hangers that we gave to the six sessions for this group we, we've done different things but we we gave them a theme so say it was um having a big conversation with the theme you'd still get to bring your own stuff you bring your own conversation and talk about what you wanted to talk about so we didn't have a training manual they just coached each other which is where the matches came so we put the coaching into the heart of the community it stopped coaching being for the bosses and it pushed it out through the organisation, made a big culture change in terms of shifting people into the not knowing into the questions. So in terms of first steps for anybody to take in their organisation, we would say bring allied <coughs> groups of people together, bring them together on purpose, bring them with a shared agreement, a contract between them, how do we want to be together, what are the rules of engagement for this group, and then travel through time together uh, as a cohort. Get the right stuff into the meeting. So endlessly we work with organisations who are meeting and they don't really know why they're meeting, they're having <coughs> the meeting that they're having, but they don't really know what the main purpose is, what the big question for that day is. And leave every single thing that can be pre-read, pre-discussed, the data, the stuff, leave it out of the actual meeting. The people, the humans are there to think better and to question each other and to support each other. They're not there to go through here's my weekly report, bang, 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 bang through the slide. It's boring and it doesn't have to be in that precious time when everybody comes together. Allow the time for human conversations. So those momentary sparks of innovation, of idea sharing, of vulnerability, of I'm not okay, of I can help, I've got time on my hands, being lost by having hour after hour after time of, of team conversations. So we need to build those human conversations in on purpose. Move out of the, not, of the knowing into the curiosity, just suspend truth and fact, get into the curious and trust that your people can do more if they think better. So what if every, every single human in your organisation thought a bit better and you ask them a question to be more clear, <coughs> that would then happen to the performance of the organisation. Be there and nowhere else. So I um, I perceive that one of the biggest risks to meetings at the moment is that people, because they're online, they've also got their phone on the go, potentially with their social media scrolling on one side. They've got childcare issues in one background. They've got a new puppy crying out the back. So being present is going to be a real problem. And um, people putting humans front and centre is going to be the challenge. And this knowledge that everyone in the organisation is potentially operating with cortisol pumping through their body and knowing that compassion has got to come up the scale of a, a high performance behaviour. It's not a little soft skill, it's not a spare thing. It's got to be the main deal. Otherwise, everybody will leave the organisation. Something like 33 million Americans have left their job in the last year um, just because they don't think they're doing what they want to be doing aligned to their personal purpose. So, retention is going to be um, the biggest challenge as well. So, um, 
I've put some further reading if people are interested in the art of thinking. Nancy Klein has a lovely quote. She's, she's a genius in terms of building thinking environments. She's got 10 components of thinking environments. She's an absolute guru in the, um, in the area. And her quote that I love the most is, sometimes the very best thing for another human being is to listen to them without interruption. And um, thank you for not interrupting me. Just to speak. I can speak about this all day and very happy to talk some more about anybody who wants to um, talk about it. But that idea that we just should quieten ourselves down and best that we think better is my life's work. So, thank you very much. Very provoking. I'm actually part of this because the great resignation, I had my resignation. I retire on May 31st and I'm trying to train up my successor and having all sorts of problems because of course he doesn't know what I know. He knows a different set of skills, but he doesn't know what I know. So how to handle it all is uh, difficult. Yeah, cortisol inducing, you might say. Uh, anyway, we're going to ask all our speakers to come back now and sit down. We're going to um, give them a load of questions. I've got a few written down here, but please fire away. This is interactive. Yeah, please all take a seat. That's a very intricate camera operator. We'll bring you all in the screen. I hope. Cool. All right. All right. Do you, do you want me to start, or has anyone got something uh, pressing they'd like to they'd like to ask? I was just wondering about the um, thank you all. That's great. Like the four day week is a really big topic, and what you've experienced in terms of businesses you're working with. Um. Well, Talita's looking at me right now. Uh, behind you there, uh, Talita works out the back, and. Uh, I don't know, I, I might ask a question to Lisa. What do you think about a four day week? Sounds like a good idea, but if, if you're trying to cram kind of the same hours into four days, then that might be impractical. I think for some people, um, you might be working around childcare or other commitments. So, just explain uh, to Lisa, is uh, a fairly new mum um, and working four day week. And that's something we, we are implementing at FBA, the phone to be able to have much more flexibility around that. And my personal view is that. Um, it's surprising uh, how many folk can actually fit. Probably they're more productive than some people who do work in five days. Um, I, I, I feel that it's that kind of flexibility is really, really important, from a, particularly from a, what was we talking about in the break, a diversity and inclusion perspective, um, particularly when the burden is still, it seems, on, on women to do the majority of childcare. So I think it's great that we retain top talent like Talita in the business because we can do that flexibility. Whether it goes right across the whole, entire organisation, um, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm curious out on that bit for me. Yeah. I, I can give you a little bit of an insight on this, if, uh, if I may. About 20 years ago, I managed a company in France, um, the uh, French subsidiary of Anglo-American Automotive Group, um, and the French government brought in something called RTT, which was the 35-hour week. Now. It wasn't that everyone had to work 35 hours a week. It was actually pro rata for the year. So we brought in a nine day fortnight. So everyone got every second Friday off. So you worked four day week and five day week. Um, and our productivity went up, just naturally went up. Um, and within the group of companies, we had all our American colleagues saying, oh, the French are a lazy lot, you know, they only work four days a week, they only work 35 hours a week, we're working 55 hours a week. Well, I, I suggested to the board that we actually had a productivity index for all the, um, uh, the, the subsidiaries to see if we're going to help each other and collaborate. And it turned out that the French um, worked the least hours and was the most productive. We, we have an insight um, where we're linking the success of the four day week to how good the organization is at measuring output and outcome rather than KPIs. So if you are empowered and tasked to deliver this thing, and we don't really care how you get there because we'll, it will be success if you do, then it doesn't matter so much how many hours you work. Obviously it's different in some manufacturing and lab based, um, or that's gonna be different. Although the data showing people are more productive four days a week, aren't they? That's what the data is showing. Um, I think uh, 
my experience, the logistics companies have been working for and for for a long, long time. I appreciate those 48 hours, I get that. A lot of people have adjusted to that, and I think the key point is to, to I mean, fill of maintenance that productivity. You know, same as working for maintenance, the same argument. If, if, if it's measurable and productive, it works. Or why, why would you not do it? Um, you know, if, if it's a benefit to do, great. The challenge I see is that, uh, is that I know people have come back from maternity leave and they've come back in four days. Didn't that be a good thing for them? I mean, hopefully it will be. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they've ended up doing five days work again, I like four. Yeah. four what's the point? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that happened to an awful lot of people on partial furlough as well. You yeah, end up doing three or four days a week, getting absolutely exhausted. And uh, uh, for a lot of Uh, I've just got a quick question, which is probably more for you. Yeah, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah, uh, Phil Kirkland, I work at the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, part of the University <coughs> of Sheffield. So, just want to touch on, on, on a question for the panel, but just to give you a little bit of feedback on a four day working week. Um, I actually run a team of engineers at the university. We run about 75 to 80 headcount, of which 20 to 25 are operational staff. So they work in a shop floor environment. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we very quickly brought that staff back into the organization to work on um, prototype ventilators. Uh, if you remember, in those early days, we had a shortage. We put them on a four day week. They traditionally worked a five day week. And this was driven by a health and safety uh, requirement that, if you remember, we were told the virus died on a cold surface or a hard surface after three days. So we thought, well, it'd be good to close the place Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and the guys work Monday to Thursday. And that's what we did. What we found very quickly was that our productivity went up in those four days. And as we gradually returned to work and uh, it, the, the operational staff actually continued working right the way through the, uh, the pandemic, is that we, we have still seen that. And as we now move towards, we are, my, my organization is actually doing a hybrid uh, pilot scheme to see how we do and get feedback from our, the rest of our organization. We loved it. The feedback I got was 100%, we need to keep this, Phil. We've got to keep this, don't take this away from us. People have got little golf clubs on a <laughs> Friday or the, you know. Seriously though, partners were able to let their other partner maybe, you know, they could help with kids, they could do other things, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a health, well-being, productivity, all ticks in the box. Conversely, they have to work at work they have to do their job at work. The rest of the staff, probably two thirds, three quarters of my staff have the ability to work flexibly from home. There's a little bit of negativity. Oh, why can't I do a four day week? Now, I would look at that and look at it on a one-to-one -one basis, but I'm part of an organization of 500 people. So these are the questions that we're all asking. What is the right thing and the wrong thing to do? But but from an operational point of view, I think it's easy to monitor and you know that productivity, the more flexible delegation and trust of that staff that don't have, you know, I am making a part in a day, they are more thought leaders in, in their field is it's slightly harder to manage. So I don't think it's, there's no easy answer, I don't think, and we're trying to gather as much data as we can. As part of my organization, my CEO is relatively new. He's been in the job two years. He, he, he wants us to, he, 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 he said, culture. Phil, will you lead it? I said, Martin, that's a big question. So I very quickly sort of said, well, yes, but I need a lot of help. Hence me coming to things like this over the last year and a half, some, some in person, some mainly, as we all know, online. I don't know where to start with this whole thing. How do I introduce, how do I reintroduce a culture that traditionally was a, traditionally a flat culture, we're, we're, we're part academic, part industrial. Um, Gen Z, I think was so interesting, Ali and uh, Phil, so interesting. We have a lot of 
engineers that join us from university uh, straight in. We are seeing much more questions. They're much more empowered in asking the nori old gaffer the questions. They challenge me on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would ask the panel, where should I focus on this? How do I focus is probably a better question. Is the question around changing the culture? Where do I no, it, I, I, don't think, I think it's shaping a culture. Mm -hmm. I think I think we've gone through a big change. I think the I don't I personally think the ability to work flexibly from home or wherever is now there. We all have a mobile or an iPad or whatever. I'm sure during breakouts we'll check an email. Or two. I'm sure everybody in this room will have done that or just that. Um, so I think it's here. I like, I think the it's trust and behavior, intent behavior, and the trust gap is very important. It's how do we, in, in, our organization is 500 people. So where do we focus? How do we do that? Our idea is to bring in subject matter experts, which we have are, are doing to run. We've done sort of full surveys through this hybrid pilot. We are looking at doing as we move forward, focus groups to get people from around the organisation. And we have spoke organisations, we don't just work, with, I happen to work in, in, in the Sheffield Rotherham area, uh, but we have an organisation in Salisbury in the northwest, we have one in Broughton <coughs> in, in Wales, and we and et cetera, et cetera. So we're across different sectors as well. So it's how do we how do we do that? It's a big apple. Yeah. You're going to say a little bite at a time. <laughs> it's a big conversation. I, I can chip in with that where we would yeah, start. That, yeah, sorry, I spoke for long. Like we would start with working out what you're trying to cause. So what what would, when you say shape a culture, what culture are you trying to get to? And then look at what shape, what culture have you got? And then break that down into micro easy behaviours. Can, can we get from that to that? How do we get from there to there? So you're building your bridges. It's like a gap analysis. What have we got? What do we want? Yeah. And communicate it and communicate it and communicate it. We that's interesting. Communicate the, the guy that's really helping me. This is our head of communications. So I've done well there, haven't I? <laughs> so that's well, good. it depends what he's communicating. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that is that we, we do the town halls, we do I run them we'll receive and transmit it. It's yeah, important. it's a two-way yeah. process. That's Absolutely. Well, one of the things I'd have uh, add on that is um, it, it's almost like it's a subculture because you, there's people have, if they're going to communicate, they've got to feel safe in communicating. And one of the problems that I see in British business and British business culture is that we're too deferential. Um, and I've been very lucky. I've managed businesses all over the world, like I say, in France, which is very formal. You know, any new company you work with in France, you say to them, Can I have an organogram, please? And they will give you a, a, like a family tree of who everyone is and what they do and how much power they have in the business. Um, I'm part Norwegian, and the Nordic style is very flat. You know, everyone goes to the same canteen together, the MP sits right next to the production workers, um, and everyone talks. And uh, that's it's just the way it is. Everyone is sort of like a, a, a little Viking tribe, if you like. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word tribe. What is it like? Yeah, so, uh, but here we have this thing of, oh, I, I, I can't answer that person back. He was my boss's boss, sort of thing. And, uh, or he's, oh, the director, there is sort of like a different social level to the, uh, the rest of us. So we can't actually say anything to them. And if they're, and if they're sort of showing signs that they're disbelieving it as well, then let's just let them do it. That's one of the reasons why I think, you know, a lot of what I talk about is ID level of this. You know, we have, we run workshops where we've got the MD and Twitter. Mm -hmm. They come together. There's no demarcation lines. And I, I first saw that in, uh, in Holland when yes. I worked for North of Line. You know, the, the, the chief executive come down and have a dinner with the guy who ties the ferries up. But every lunchtime happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But that piece is just breaking those barriers down. So they feel, is they both understand each other. And I think both, if they both come out of that workshop, both understand each other is the key point. It's yeah. not just to go, oh, I understand what the fit does. They need to understand what the, uh, what the MD does on that basis. And if you can create that environment, you can start that trust piece that, well, I don't mind actually raising something, you know, but it's creating those environments that you can allow that freedom to, uh, to do that yeah. piece. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can I add on to that? But yeah, I mean, uh, interesting enough, by, uh, uh, I think, I think I'm right, it's in the NHS, the biggest employer. Western in Europe. Europe. Yeah. Uh, my wife works in NHS, not not on the clinical side, it's in, in the management and all that sort of side. And, and without a shadow of a doubt, they have a, a system, uh, certainly in the group she works in, whereby they don't feel it's appropriate to reach out to somebody above their level. So she's a manager and her people who work for her would never dream of going to somebody above her to speak about something. And my wife doesn't go above the level above her because she feels it isn't appropriate. To con but I said, well, just call them. When I, mean, I work for a German company, and actually, you know, that's an interesting uh, organization structure in its own right. But obviously, I'm, I'm based in the UK, but they have a very formal way of doing things. Um, but I think it's it's crazy that you shouldn't be able to, or the structure or the culture shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to just go up to the managing director, CEO, you know, and, and ask a question of them without feeling that you're overstepping a boundary. And that's the culture we should all be aiming for, I think. Which is why I think the point about how you do it now, just small pieces, yeah. means it's more manageable and sellable. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're going to take small pieces, small steps, easy win. Yeah. And that's the phrase you want to use. You've got a much more chance of that aligning with that culture. You can slowly move it forward and almost change it from within, which is yeah. small steps. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, working in American um, companies in America, you know, they're, they're, it's all about selling. The, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, everyone's yeah. totally open yeah. to being sold to. Yeah. You know, you try the same attitude with most people in this country, they want to hide under the desk. Why are you trying to sell to me? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other critical piece of changing culture is looking what the lead team's doing, what, what's coming from the top, because people will be watching and listening and learning and following yeah. that. So if you can get the, the little mini culture at the top to start to change first, you're onto something. Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, sorry, just to just to close off. That's really interesting, and, and thank you. I think that's a really good comment there as well. Um, yeah, the inverted triangle I love because we work in research innovation, and I, I, obviously as a, as a as a leader, as a as a manager of a, of a team, there I have people far more intelligent than me in the in the field that I actually lead the team in. Uh, but that I think that's a good thing. I, I hope I give them the freedom to do their jobs. Um, I think you're right. I think I think behaviour is it is, is incredibly important. I think it's yeah. It, it's there's a, a fear of failure is too much sometimes in this country. I notice. I'm, a, I'm working with a design team, and we're trying to take a very simple thing. We're trying to take food packaging and do other things with it, like packaging parts for lithium ion batteries, uh, that. So I've got a brilliant designer I'm working with. And I'm saying to him, look, you know, this is something new. You're not going to get it right all the time. It's going to be an iterative process. And I know my managing director is actually saying, my managing director is actually in the same office block as him. So I'm saying, well, why are you doing it like that? That's obviously going to fail. That's the point of the genius that mm -hmm. you raised. Yeah, you know, this idea we don't, we don't recognize that. I, I always do the bit that's, um, we always do the joke about working hard. That bit. There's always been Hollywood movies where there's, you know, a load of empty cans where someone's worked all night, but you don't really see that. It's all the work behind the scenes to, to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, you know, the bit where James Dyson, where someone's knocking on the door for pay the rent and he's trying to hide from. We don't see that bit. We see him you know, launching the product, and, and I think we've got to recognise that there's a lot of work that goes behind all of that before we get the eureka moment. So we've got to. We've almost got to fail to think well, that's the wrong way to do it. You're right. right, and we're not encouraging that piece of failure constructively. Mm, constructive yeah. failure to learn from it. Yeah, yeah, I can do that with that last kid. Yeah, sort of thing. yeah, yeah. I think it's probably something that most sports actually done very well. We're mm. very used to actually doing lots of stuff, and it's very slow. And all the time. Well, I'll just build on that, if I may, just a story from my own career um, at uh, RS Components. Um, so RS Components, uh, famously the marketing director didn't last too long there actually because biggest, one of the biggest British companies that no one's ever heard of. Um, but uh, we, as I joined RS Components, there was a massive problem with culture with regards to developing new ideas, basically innovation. And the way we got around the fear of failure, well, let me explain why is there a fear of failure? Because there's 500,000 products the RS components, it's got about eight warehouses around the world, they ship 42,000 parcels internationally. And you imagine the systems, the infrastructure is running that. If you do something that breaks that, 
you get a couple of days of lost sales. That's massive. Um, and the way we got around it was, um, I'm sure as if you're familiar with the term skunk works. So mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you, get, you get people working in isolation in the safe spaces. Mm -hmm. So we worked out initially which areas of the website, which areas of the back end systems are actually, if you tinker with that and you break it, it's not going to end, end the world. And we built a small agile team, the first agile team. Beforehand, if you wanted to make a change on the website or the back end systems, you waited six months for the half yearly strategic release um, and nothing ever got done. Mm. So we set this small agile team up, it's about six people, and we just made a change to the search system. At the time, if you searched for a hammer on the RS Components website, you got 17,000 results. Um, anything with H, A, and R in the results is terrible. So we just did work on that. And what we did is we were able to prove very, very quickly, a bit like motorsport, you're either winning or you're losing. And you could actually show the incremental, incremental benefit from the revenue perspective. And what that meant was after 18 months, we ended up with six agile teams. RS Components now is one of the, if you look them up on the e-consultancy or any of these uh, uh, companies, you'll see that they are the epitome of agile um, and, and uh, agile development. So it's about six agile teams, and about 72 million pounds worth of incremental revenue. But it all came from being able to make sure that people were not afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to lose their jobs for making a mistake. Yeah. That's as much about the environment as it is about the attitude you create. It became it actually became a little bit of a counterculture. Mm -hmm. It was like the pirate team within, <laughs> within the organization. <laughs> right? You go to the coffee shop and people stand there a bit further away from the <laughs> But it works. Sounds like the automatic pigment caravan. Time for more questions, but if you're hungry, we can go for lunch. Um, what do you reckon? One question. Yep. It's, uh, in terms of something to about 75% of the um, workforce work at home now. Yep. For part of the week. For part of the week. Yeah. I mean, do you hear our other members of the country? Do you think that's going to change? We're still at early stage on. Do you think that's going to start dropping down? If you want my, my view on it, it will start at 10. I think we've probably got to the point where it's going to settle and go back up again. I think uh, it will not fall below 35%. That's just my view. Go back up again to more people working from home. More people yeah. working from home. Yeah. And I think it will go back up to the 40, 45% mm -hmm. working from home from some or some part of the week. Yes. It's a guess. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a dangerous assumption? Because it's the what's pandemic. What, what is a pandemic now? No one talks about it anymore. But clearly, we're talking this is all to do with the what's now at the back of it. And, it just strikes me you look at a number like that, and I'll try and relate that to a company going, there's no way a manufacturing engineering company are going to have that amount of staff that they can have for what, you, what happens by putting numbers out like this. It's almost like giving the power back to the employee again. They go, well, sorry, but I've got to work from home. Mm. And then you're getting all the rounds in of HR and legal arguments and stuff. Mm. The figures are brilliant. Yep. We've seen figures for figures sake for months now around the pandemic. We don't see anything. But it just strikes me when you put these headline figures out, people start making assumptions. It drives, you know, the employees to have, you know, ideas above their. I thought it's brilliant when you said about benefit. It's a benefit to work from home. Yes. It's not a given. But the problem is people look at numbers right. and they believe it's a given. And that drives I'm, a whole different thought process around it. I mean, there's certain companies you can certainly work from home. There's no issues with it. I can't see that's going to translate to every single organisation and company across the country. But you'll drive that culture within the people if you're not careful. And, and you're right, that's the danger of, of, of putting a figure there, which is clearly an average in your company. But there will be companies out there where it is impossible for anyone to work from home. Uh, there are other companies out there, or not organisations, where 100% of people can work from home quite easily. Um, and it's just on an, it's an individual company, an individual role, job role basis. Thank you. Well, the enterprise yeah. proven itself as a, as a, as a a legitimate way of working. I think that's the fundamental thing. Yeah. Stuff. Stop that idea that there are people who work from home. From so it's a discussion point. I also think there's a cultural catch up piece of organisations to change the way they do things to, discuss, to determine whether that works or not. And I was talking earlier on, I was at the Coventry Transport Summit, which sounds really glamorous, but it really was. It was good, but it was, wasn't glamorous. And there was a guy from West Midlands Rail and Midland Connect, and they were saying they expect their passenger levels to be back up to pre pandemic by the end of the year. So now that's based on the surveys and discussions they've had, but I think there's a place for it. Um, but I agree, I think you're in danger of you're in danger of creating a, something that isn't there potentially. Um, but I think it's where it works, it works. 
Um, some people got it right, some people got it wrong. Um, I think some people are still very resistant to it. Necessity is the mother of all we mentioned, etc. I'll tell you, that's a difficult one to really yeah. our, our sense is that um, we're nowhere near settling points and being able to know where the tipping point will come and what's going to happen. Where it feels, I don't, I don't think it's a good analogy, but I, I was a member of First Direct Bank who set up as an internet bank. That's how they set mm -hmm. up, and they didn't have to transition from the marketplace at the high street to online they just did it brilliantly from that where the ones who've had to drag themselves online have had a much harder shift across into the new world my sense is that the work from home thing has been that for lots of organizations they've been dragged into them having people working from home and it was an emergency response and they did some good stuff and they did some awful stuff some organizations have set up to be able to work from home and they're going to find it easier and it'll be different for them and I don't think Gen Z are looking at it in a kind of how can we move from what was to what is. Mm. They're like, what do we create that makes life great and mm. the better? Mm. So I, I think we're miles off knowing what it's going to be like. There's some interesting stats from online shopping. If you look at online shopping where it is, because again, it's the eye of the beholder. You know, if you look at the actual grocery shopping, it didn't massively increase online. Non-grocery shopping did significantly. So there are still a lot of people who want to go to the supermarket. Now, I don't know what they do want to do, that's what they want to do, that's, that's, <laughs> what, it, that's what it looks like. Uh, that's not really, that's not really, that number's not really changed, it's come back down again. So maybe if you look at, sounds a bit patronised, but if you look at stats other areas, maybe that gives you a bit of an indication, but I totally agree, I don't think we've got any idea, you know, predicting, because we haven't got the data or information really at this stage. I think there's one, personally, I, I think there's one thing that is going to be really certain now, is that if you're a boss, and you insist on people being back in the office mm. five days a week, you're going to lose people. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's probably the uh, You won't even get uh, uh, we, we have data at our organisation mm. that absolutely backs that. Right. Mm. We are seeing people leave our organisation um, because no. and we, and we are offering that, but it, it's their, you know, they're, they're leaving to go in, in other um, high value manufacturing type of industry driven jobs where this whole flexibility thing and you're absolutely right this gen z thing on the technology is there and and they want that flexibility but they're not looking at it from a linear perspective no in the australia yeah. because it's correct best for the job. Uh, absolutely right. what they want to do. And, and, and it's a big it's a big thing you know in yeah. in their benefit yeah. of working yeah I, I take your point absolutely about running a, a factory maybe mm -hmm. i don't think i don't think we know Yet. If you had this conversation in a make UK seminar or even an SMMT seminar, it would be a totally different conversation. Mm. Totally different. Mm. One of the things that I'm not hearing so much today in this conversation is the positive twist on mm. the, the ability to recruit from the whole global mm. population of talent. You know, one of our clients is AO, you know, the AO Let's Go, the electric, electrical suppliers. They've got a fantastic high scale business in Bolton. And they've really struggled to get the start superstars to move to Bolton to work for them. And now they can just take their pick of anyone globally because mm -hmm. they've been doing it. Yeah, you have to see Bolton from time to time. Nothing was anything wrong with Bolton. I'm from near there, but it's harder to get people to leave London than yeah. think, they don't need to. I think, I think companies prior to COVID would have had a natural, the management structure perhaps, you know, living perhaps in the past would have a natural fear of people working from home. Because the, the, the sometimes if you're a bit old fashioned, the natural thought is that people <coughs> working at home are not going to work, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that. And that's just it's the wrong view to look on it. Lots of people are really productive work from home, you know, and I, and I, I think that a balance sure, is. You should have to have somebody right in front of you all the time managing. If you're doing that, you've got something fundamentally wrong, whether they're there absolutely. or in a, an office 30 miles away. Yeah. yeah makes sense. If you're managing, you manage. Yeah. I think it's, it's, drag, it's drag companies to a position whereby. They may have eventually got there at some point in the future, you know. But it's it's the thing with COVID. The positive out of it is it has driven a massive change in, in operations and culture and companies and structure and how those people those companies operate. And it's also forced, hopefully, forced leaders or managers, let's call them managers, to turn into perhaps leaders because they have to adapt. And if they don't adapt, people don't like the culture and they leave. So you know, it's, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, there's a big push on the online side of things, but that means a lot of companies were traditionally a haulage business with a warehouse suddenly pat themselves around as a we're an order fulfillment company. Well, 
that's a, that's a different world. In a different world, there was just the flip side is there are a lot of tech companies are coming into logistics, and if you can get the best system in the world, it's not going to stop the M25 coming. <laughs> so it's understanding you know, there's a cultural piece there, but that, that's a different set of skills. It's a different set of skills for people. So you need to track you need to track the talent in. If you're going to get the people in, as Dr. Lally said, you need to be, well, make the job interesting for them. Otherwise, they're going to go, well, I don't want to work here. Frankly, that's the point. Why do I have to work in office? For what reason? When I don't need to do that to yeah, do my yeah. job. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's an argument I've been having for 20 years with yeah. very certain bosses. It's so yeah. frustrating. Yeah. So I can, I can do the job to so what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Ben, do you want to uh, open the uh, the lunch session? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, so thank you very much for all our speakers. Thank you very much. Now as well, much appreciate it. Um, now, obviously, now very flippantly, just invited you all to go and have lunch. Um, but as as you know, with events that I run, there's no such thing as free lunch. <laughs> so, so what I would like you all to do, please, and, and we've seen the statistics, so whatever percentage of you was already social scrolling anyway, so if you have your phone already, which you please do, or at least the percentage of you will, can you please use it to scan that QR code and give us some feedback on this event, uh, not just on what you thought of this event uh, specifically, but also let us know what you want to hear about um, in the future. Um, I would also like to have a, do a very quick show of hands, please, if, if you can. Um, because this is, I mean, normally for the digital and advanced manufacturing group, we talk about obviously manufacturing, additive manufacturing, industry 4.0, all that sort of good stuff. With this event, we wanted to do something slightly differently because obviously we recognize it's a very different world out there. Um, what's the appetite in the room for us as the SDC to do more of this sort of, sort of stuff? Do you, do you want to see more of this? Is, is this a, a valuable subject we should explore more or shall we go back to talk about techie stuff? We will be talking about techie stuff anyway because that's what we do. But do you want us to throw more of this sort of stuff in? Can I just have a show of hand on yeah. YouTube? Yeah. Well, that's it's quite a few of you, so it's we'll, we'll, we'll have a go with that and we'll, we'll, we'll build that in. Um, so just a couple of other things. So while you're all filling that in, it takes about a minute. There's only a couple of boxes to take. It's really easy. Uh, but while you're doing that, I kind of want to um, mention a couple of things that, that are coming up. So we talked about mentoring. Um, which feels like a really good op opportunity for me to mention that together with Be The Business, we're actually offering a mentor scheme, um, which is very effective. It's a 12-month program where you can get face-to-face -face, uh, meetings with a mentor on a specific area that you, that you want. Um, if it feels like I'm selling, I'm not really, because it's actually completely free of charge and you don't even have to be an SST member. Uh, so if you want to know more, obviously go to our website or, or get in touch. Um, and also on the um, point that Ali just made, where you can now employ people from all over the world, I know that one of the webinars that we've got coming up will specifically delve into um, how you can best do that and how you can make that work for your company. So do have a look at the website as well on how to do that. Um, of course, visit the website anyway, because it's full of really good stuff and lots of interesting events that you should all attend. Um, but when you've um, done all of that, um, and clearly not before, you're free to have your lunch. Uh, so please have a go and do all of that, and then uh, please enjoy your lunch. And thank you very much. Thank you.